All right, hey everyone, I have just started the Twitter space. I'm gonna send out a message to invite other people to join. This is gonna be a recording for episode 60 of the Actively Unwoke podcast. And I do hope we'll be able to get some people in here and chatting. I do see some people watching over on YouTube. I will be simulcasting this live on YouTube if people would prefer to join there. But uh, I would love it if people would come and join and talk to me or I will just rant and rave about all the things you need to know about the Marxist left in the United States that uh, people like James Lindsay refuse to teach you. And let me just send out a note about this. Okay. And hopefully people will come and join me in the space if you are on YouTube and you would like to come chat with me. Um, then please feel free to do so. Now, as a reminder, so why, why are we doing this? I want to back up for a second. So James Lindsay has lost his goddamn mind. I think we can all agree on that. I have had very strong intellectual criticisms of James Lindsay's work for months and months and months and months and months. Ever since I really started listening to him again after not listening to him for probably about two and a half years. And when I started listening to him again, he had gone off of his rocker and I was really disappointed to see it. And I started making intellectual criticisms of his work based on the fact that I've spent basically the last three and a half years of my life, almost every single day I do this six days a week, uh, watching far leftist trainings, going into their events, uh, infiltrating them, recording them. I've done undercover work in person. Um, I have watched more queer Marxist trainings than anyone else on the internet. I've covered more Abolish the Family content than anyone on the internet. I have an archive of thousands of hours of far left radical trainings. These, these are the things that happen in the real world to recruit real activists to the far left. Um, I have a massive archive of clips. I have a sub stack where I break all this stuff down. What I'm trying to say is like, I've got some game and I have a lot of backup sources for, I, I have backup sources for every single thing that I say. And the thing of it is, is what I see in the real world with the left and what the left is teaching and how the left is recruiting more people to their cause, it has absolutely nothing to do with what James Lindsay is telling his audience. And for me, this is actually a really big problem. And and to be, and to be again, really blunt, this is an intellectual criticism of James Lindsay's work. This is a really big problem because if the goal is to defeat the left, you need to understand the left. You need to understand your enemy in order to defeat them. This is Sun Tzu, the art of war, 101 level stuff. And what I see happening is conservative conservatives through organizations like Moms for Liberty, uh, through organizations like Turning Point USA, through media outlets like the Daily Wire and the Blaze and Fox News and all of these things, they're being fed a very specific narrative about what the left is doing that is not hinged into reality. And one of the reasons they're being fed this narrative is because of James Lindsay. Now, I've tried to be reasonable with him. My community has tried to be reasonable with him. And in the past couple of days, and James Lindsay has been making character attacks on me for months. James Lindsay has been lying about me. He's been smearing me. He's been doing all this stuff. In the past couple of days, James Lindsay has absolutely lost his mind. He literally just tweeted earlier today that the reason I'm making intellectual criticisms of his work is because I quote unquote want him. He's, he's saying that the reason I'm making intellectual criticisms of his work is because I have narcissistic personality disorder or borderline personality disorder. He completely ignores all the primary source evidence that I've collected over the years. He completely ignores people who have been following this just as closely as I am, who are all waving the flag saying, James, you need to look at this. You need to factor this into what you're doing because right now millions of people are being misled because of James Lindsay. And I'm not okay with that. And I'm not going to sit idly by and watch this happen. Now, I might not have the platform that James Lindsay has. That's true enough. But what I do have is more evidence than James Lindsay has ever encountered in the real world. And so I'm going to do a series of podcasts and they're going to be live Twitter spaces and anyone can come on and ask me questions and I will engage in discussion with anyone where I'm going to detail my intellectual criticisms of James Lindsay's work and what I think people need to understand about the far left in order to defeat them. So if people have, and again, I really do mean this, I will intellectually engage with anyone. 
What I will not do is participate in these character attacks like James Lindsay is. Because in the months and months and months that he's been accusing me of having personality disorders and saying I sexually want him and he's been uh, struggle sessioning people to take my credit out of things. He's been telling his audience to block me, to block members of my community. Like in, in the months that he's been doing this, James has never once interacted with the intellectual criticisms that I have of his work. And so I'm not going to play this game where we're hurling insults back and forth. That's not what I want to do. I want to be productive about this. And so last night, I formally challenged James Lindsay publicly to a debate based on four very specific intellectual criticisms I have of his work. Now, make no mistake, I have significantly more than four intellectual criticisms of his work. And maybe if this series keeps going, um, I can go into all of those because it's just like the list is endless of the things that people need to know that James Lindsay is absolutely not teaching them that he absolutely should be. But my goal is with this is I think I want my community to start a pressure campaign on James Lindsay to actually start engaging with the intellectual criticisms I'm making of his work. And so that's what I'm going to be focused on moving forward. And if James doesn't like me talking about him and James doesn't like me showing people the things that he's saying and James doesn't like me providing receipts that he's having a massive meltdown on Twitter, then James can start actually engaging on an intellectual level and pretend he's an academic for once. Because the reality is when you are in academia, and I have a PhD, a PhD too, when you are in academia, you have to engage with criticism and you have to challenge your own confirmation bias and you have to be able to have intellectual discussions with people without saying, you're a narcissist or you're just saying that because you want me. I mean, it's such a kindergarten level of argumentation. So we're not going to do that. We're going to pressure James to have an intellectual conversation. And if he doesn't want to do that, which I suspect he will never answer my challenge of having a debate with him, and people can read the former the formal challenge over on my Substack, which is Carlin, K-A-R-L-Y-N dot Substack dot com. Um, if James isn't going to answer it, I'm still going to teach people what I think that they need to know. And the people who show up will learn and the people who don't show up will not learn. And that's just going to be the way it is. So we're going to start with the first criticism that I have with James Lindsay's work. And this really goes to foundational knowledge about the left. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk for a little bit. And I want to invite anyone who has questions at any point to grab a microphone in the space and come up and talk to me. And you can do this at any point. I'm willing to engage in conversation at any point. Um, but I'm just going to talk until people start doing that. I do ask that uh, people keep the conversation respectful. We don't all have to agree, but I do not want this to devolve into hurling insults or things like that. I just don't think that's a productive use of time. So where we're going to start off today is about what the true goal of the left is. And for people who follow my work, this is not going to be new information. But sadly, for people who might be new to my work, who have followed James Lindsay for a long time, this will be new information. And this is one of the chief complaints I have with James, because how I, I there is a litmus test that I use to figure out if someone actually understands the far left in this country. And that's by asking them one simple question. How does the left define capitalism? That's really all I need to ask to know if someone understands the far left in this country. Because what James Lindsay would say is, everyone knows that the left wants to abolish capitalism. That is a kindergarten level analysis. Okay, yeah, it's fair enough that everyone knows the left wants to abolish capitalism. But what does that actually mean? Can you actually define how the left defines capitalism? Now, I want to be very clear. In this discussion, I am not offering you an opinion on how the left defines capitalism. What I am telling you is what I have seen over and over and over and over and over again in far leftist trainings. So I'm not giving you what I think. I'm giving you the theme that has shown up again across different activists, across different organizations, across different trainings. I have all of this stuff on video. Every single thing I say, I can back up with receipts on video of real leftists telling this to other people. The definition that the far left has of capitalism is private property ownership. Okay, that seems simple enough, right? But then we have to dig into 
what does private property ownership mean? Because this is important. When the left says they want to abolish capitalism, what do they actually want to abolish? They want to abolish your ability to own a home. They want to abolish your ability to own land. They want to abolish your ability to own an apartment that you rent out as a landlord or have as an Airbnb. They want to abolish your ability to own intellectual property. They want to abolish your ability to own a business, whether that business is a small business or a large business. They want to abolish your parental rights over your children. They believe that parental rights are a form of private property. They want to abolish your individual liberties, things like freedom of speech, freedom of religion. Those things are also considered to be private property under capitalism. The left wants all health care to be public, to be free, to be unlimited for anything. They want you to be able to get as many trans-affirming surgeries as you want on the public dollar, as much psychiatric care and as much psychiatric medication as you want on the public dollar. They want you to be able to get as many abortions as you want, free, unlimited, up to birth on the public dollar. This is where universal health care comes from. The left wants all schooling to be provided by the state. That means they want all everyone to have to go through public school. Public school would be considered compulsory. They want to eliminate all private schooling, all homeschooling, all charter schooling. Everyone gets the same type of schooling. The left wants to control all energy. So they want to control all gas that you put in the gasoline that you put in your car. They want to control who has uh, heat, like heat and electricity to heat their homes in the winter to basically be able to turn the lights on. There's that classic picture of the difference between North and South Korea, where like you see all the lights on in South Korea, but you see none of the lights on in North Korea. That's exactly what we're talking about. The left wants to eliminate all private providers of energy um, so that you are dependent upon the state for your energy. This last one is possibly the scariest one. The left wants the state to be responsible for the distribution of all food. That means no private food providers. You go to the state for the food. They give you what they want to give you, regardless of if it's what you want, regardless of if it's what you need, regardless of even if you enjoy the food. The left, the, the left wants the state to provide all food to the community. They want to set up community canteens in uh, in cities where instead of eating in your home, you go to the communal area to uh, to get your food in the communal canteen. By the way, I also have them on video talking about how they want to abolish literally private kitchens. So they don't want you to have a private kitchen in your home. Why is that? Because the left believes if they abolish private kitchens, if they have food distribution centers in the middle of towns, then what that's going to mean is the nuclear family is going to end up being abolished because dinner time around kind of the kitchen table or the dining room table, that's one of the glues that holds the nuclear family together. So that's a lot of stuff, right? And I don't expect everyone to memorize this list off the top of their head, but I want to give people an idea of what this future society looks like. And this is really important. Saying the left wants to abolish capitalism is such a throwaway. What does that mean? How is that going to impact your life? Every single thing that I just listed is currently showing up in the world today. It's showing up in what your kids are learning in public schools. It's showing up in um, in leftist publications and leftist news outlets all over the country. We can spot how the left is making these attacks on all these different systems that uphold our society. But if you don't know how the left defines the term capitalism and that everything the left is doing leads back to the abolition of capitalism, you're not going to be able to recognize these things when it shows up right in front of you. Let me talk a little bit more about some other aspects of this because I just said that you need to be able to understand how everything the left is doing goes back to the abolition of capitalism, okay? So, for example, critical race theory, anti-racism, gender ideology, attacks on parental rights, all of this, and we'll get into some of these a little bit more in future podcasts, but all of this goes back to the abolition of capitalism. Environmental justice, like things like Greta Thunberg is doing, environmental activism, that goes back to the abolition of capitalism. Anything related to social justice, social inequality, it goes back to the abolition of capitalism. Abolish the police, defund the police. It all goes back to the abolition 
of capitalism. And again, I, I don't feel like I'm being too pedantic here because a lot of even even things like what's going on in Palestine, the whole idea of queers for Palestine, queers for Palestine has been this thing that has constantly been confusing to people on the conservative right. They see signs like queers for Palestine and they're like, how does like how what, what does queer people have to do with, you know, being involved with Palestine? What does this have to do with anything? Well, if you understand that everything the left is doing goes back to abolishing capitalism, then you start to understand what queers for Palestine means. So let's let's just go through some of these and let's uh, let's talk about them. So uh, and I'll I'll start with queers for Palestine. The whole idea behind queers for Palestine is that the left believes that everyone in the world who lives in what they call capitalist societies or under capitalist governments in the United States. We live in a capitalist society. We live under a capitalist U.S. government. That's what they want to abolish. The left believes that everyone who lives under capitalism is inherently oppressed by capitalism, that capitalism only serves the very wealthy and it oppresses everyone else. They don't see capitalism as the avenue towards the American dream. All right. So when we're talking about queers for Palestine, there are a couple different factors that we need to talk about. So first we need to talk about queer, and then we need to talk about Palestine. Queer is a far left political ideology that is designed to destabilize what they call normativity. Normativity is anything that upholds capitalism. It is a societal norm. It is what normal people do. Capitalism is the quote unquote norm in the United States. Queer liberation, and this is according to the Mary Nardney Gang, who is a far-left queer anarcho-communist group. We read their uh, seminal work last week uh, uh, towards the queerest insurrection. You can find the podcast on my Substack. The Mary Nardney Gang says, queer liberation necessitates the annihilation of capitalism. That's how they're defining it. Queers will only be liberated when capitalism is abolished because they believe that capitalism is the thing that's oppressing them. Okay, so that that takes care of queer. Let's talk about Palestine. The left is not anti-Semitic, not in the way that the right likes to say that they are, because it's a very convenient argument for the right to say that, you know, all of these kids protesting on college campuses, all of these pro-Palestinian protesters are really pro-Hamas, and they're doing that because they hate the Jews. Well, that's not actually true. In fact, the left doesn't actually care if people are Jewish. There are actually Jewish organizations on the left, by the way. Jewish Voices for Peace is a far leftist organization. They're one of the organizations that were, was involved in the um, campus protests. They've been actively protesting against what Israel's been doing for a, a long time. Um, Jewish Voices for Peace, and also there were other rabbis, too, that were actually on the college encampments, and they were holding Shabbat dinner on the campuses. They were, you know, hanging out with the students. So if the students were really as anti-Semitic as the uh, conservative right likes to paint them, I don't think that that would actually be happening because they are, in fact, Jewish, you know. Um, but my point is this. So the left, the left is not anti-Semitic. The left doesn't hate Jews. The left believes that Israel is representative of the settler colonists. Colonization or colonialization is code word for capitalism. What it means is taking indigenous land away from the indigenous people, stealing indigenous land and privatizing it under the oppressive force of capitalism. Uh, decolonization, which is what they believe the Palestinians are doing, is taking the colonized land back. So if capitalism is defined as private property ownership, we've already talked about that, and private property ownership includes the land, like you not being able to buy land, what the left believes is that indigenous people didn't quote unquote own the land that they were on. They were instead caretakers of the land that they're on. When the evil capitalists who are the, the settler colonists, Israel in this case, came in, they had to steal the land that was under the uh, caretaking of the indigenous people and privatize it under the oppressive force of capitalism. This is where land blessings come from. Land blessings are literally mourning the loss of the land. That's why they say we are on the land of the uh, yada, yada, yada tribe in South Dakota or whatever before they do an event or something. 
because they're acknowledging these are the original caretakers of the land. And when this land is, quote unquote, decolonized, these people will will take it back from the evil capitalist oppressors. So the Israel-Palestine conflict for the left is not about Jew versus Arab. They don't care about any of that. It's about capitalist settler colonist oppressors versus the Palestinians who are trying to decolonize the land. In in fact, this is like the less glorious revolution. The left has never they, the left basically all the left talks about these days are, is Palestine. It's actually crazy. The left used to talk about a variety of topics before last year, before October seventh. They would talk about all this queer stuff, all this gender stuff, all this abolish the family stuff. They do tenant rights things. They do a lot. They used to do a lot more in education. It, it's actually funny. The Palestinian conflict has really tampered down educational activism on the left, which I suppose is a good thing. But it's also like everything has become about Palestine on the left and the reason that everything has become about palestine on the left is the palestinians because they're trying to decolonize the land from israel are engaging in the glorious uprising that the left wants to see against capitalism and they want to see this everywhere so let's go back to that phrase queers for palestine queer means the annihilation of capitalism the palestinians are fighting back against the evil capitalist oppressors, they are in the same struggle. The struggle is the glorious revolution. That is what Queers for Palestine means. It is not a reference to being gay. It is not a reference to being trans. It is a reference to being in solidarity or being comrades, being members of the party with the Palestinians who are engaging in this uprising. This is why it's important to understand that the real goal of the left is always abolishing capitalism, no matter what they're doing. Let's take critical race theory or anti-racist training or things about whiteness, white supremacy. This has nothing to do with skin color. Now, there are, you can always point out kind of onesies and twosies on the left where you'll find a crazy person that posts a TikTok video calling for the death of white people. I'm not saying these things don't happen, but what people need to understand is when you're doing qualitative analysis, which is what I'm doing here, I'm listening to a lot of qualitative data and I'm looking for themes in that qualitative data. When you are doing qualitative analysis, you're not looking for the anomalies that make the best clickbait content on the internet. You're looking for the themes that show up over and over and over and over and over and over and over again consistently. And so when it comes to this whole, the left hates white people and that's what critical race theory is and they're discriminating against white people, that's not what they're doing. That is a conservative right-wing interpretation of what's going on based on clickbait outrage content that's been posted on the internet that is not hinged into reality with what the left is actually teaching. Let me explain again. How does this all relate back to abolishing capitalism? Because the left believes that capitalism, which again is defined as private property ownership, created the institution of slavery in the United States. What slavery means is owning people as private property. So slavery is not about like race necessarily, although that's where whiteness and blackness come from. It's like the white people were the bourgeois, black people were the owned private property. It is fundamentally about private property ownership. The left then believes that slavery created the institution of systemic racism. If you look in the dictionary definition of racism, you are going to see that they changed the definition to systemic racism like in, in 2020, mid-2020 during the George Floyd uprising or the George Floyd rebellion as the left calls it. Systemic racism means the system that upholds racism. So it's not a reference to skin color. Systemic racism is the system that upholds racism. Another term for that is institutional racism, the institution that upholds racism. In both cases, that institution is capitalism because the left believes that if you just abolish capitalism, that will fix all racism because there will no longer be racial disparities in this country because everyone will have access to everything they need. 
let's talk about abolish the police because abolish the police relates directly to this you guys there's a lips of tiktok thing going around today you can find it on my timeline it's a sign that was hung up allegedly in like a school in boston where one of the things that it says on that sign is that uh the police are descendants from uh, slave catchers so what does that mean and by the way, you have to put aside whether or not any of this is true. It doesn't matter if any of this is true. You know what I just realized for the Twitter space? You know what I just realized? That I've been talking, I think, for like 25 minutes. <laughs> and you guys couldn't hear me because I was on mute. Holy shit. I'm sorry, guys. I was doing a great podcast. And you guys couldn't hear me because I was on mute. <laughs> Luckily, I think the YouTube recording does have this. Um, so I apologize again for that if you guys couldn't hear me. <laughs> I was like, why am I not getting any reactions? What is going on? <laughs> it's Monday. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Oh, gosh. Do I start again? Oh, no. Oh, no. You can hear me on Twitter spaces? Okay, okay. Well, let me uh let me bring up some people to speak, I guess. <laughs> Let's bring up some people to speak and you guys can catch the rest of this on the uh Oh, you guys can hear me on the spaces? Yeah, I was able to hear you. Yeah, the whole time. Carl, you, guys heard you, the whole time. <laughs> you guys were able yeah. to hear me. Okay, that's good. Yeah, that's thank good. You. Thankfully, yeah. Hang on one sec. Let me just uh, change the sound on my computer because now it's coming through my speakers and my dogs are barking. Everything's going crazy. Okay, so you guys could hear me then. You did that? You could hear all that? I heard it all. Yep. Oh, okay, Heidi, you yes, heard it all. Okay, thank God. Okay, so apparently something was going right. All right, all right, all right. Well, you guys are on stage now, so I guess like I we can we can do a quick pause there. And I know you guys can hear me on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Fluffy Cow Respect on YouTube says I'm a boomer. Yeah, it's true. Well, maybe it's more of a lack of coffee. Let's uh let's go with that. Um but uh so 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 what do you guys think so far about what I've said then, Heidi? You can you you said you could hear it. Like what do you think? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think you're a hundred percent right. I mean, I I was on the left and you know, so I know all this stuff. Um, you know, it's not surprising to me when you say this stuff. Like I, it's just because I've been there and I've been to these types of conferences and I went to UC Santa Cruz and I, you know, got a degree in politics from UC Santa Cruz, which is about the furthest left uh, you can get for that major um, if people don't know. But the whole the whole concept of UC Santa Cruz is actually like completely like set up to be a leftist institution. It's it's changed a bit now because they focus on STEM. But anyway, um, so yeah, so I've heard all this, know all this, and it makes it like just kind of come together very clear for me and somebody that's been on the left and has left the left. But I can see how it's confusing for people on the right. Like the queers for Palestine probably is the best example um, because <laughs> it's just that, you know, it's so easy to clip these things and be like, the left is so ridiculous. Look at these freaks with like blue hair talking about queers for Palestine. Like that makes no sense. And it's like, no, I mean, it doesn't make sense if you're looking at it from that perspective. No, but it makes complete 100% sense. Like if you, like you said, if you understand what the left means um, by queer, what the left means, you know, when they talk about Palestine, what the left means with capitalism and the oppressor and the oppressor, the oppressors and the oppressees, you know, everything's about oppression. Um, and if you understand that and start to put that together, then it makes perfect sense. And yeah, it's just frustrating. It is very frustrating um, to see, you know, that we people just don't know who their enemy is at all. So well, I appreciate you doing this work and continuing to and I'm sure it's painful at this point, honestly, to like <laughs> yeah. continue to listen to this stuff and, and then also like regurgitate it. Um, but you do such a good job. And it's very clear what you're saying. So I appreciate the talk and I'm glad you weren't muted. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm glad you guys could actually hear what I was saying. Um, <laughs> that like freaked me. I was like, oh, no. But no, I mean, that and that's and that's exactly the point. It's like I, I mean, I was always on the left, but I was never a, a leftist. I was never really involved in like radical leftist politics. I was more just like kind of like a Democrat that didn't know what was going on. And so a lot of this for me was kind of like I had to process a lot of this information. And I think, you know, I didn't even I guess I didn't realize looking back how much like 
socialism I was delivered in certain content, like especially in college, um, like when, you know, I remember very distinctly being in an international relations class that was taught by Billy Corgan's uncle of all people, um, Billy Corgan of the Smashing Pumpkins. And like, uh, and, and like he had a whole class about how communism is the highest evolution of society and all this stuff. And I kind of brushed it off at the time and didn't really think of it. But uh, but it was definitely stuff I was exposed to. But I do think that, you know, when you grew up in a conservative household, from what I've understood and gathered, or even like other political ideologies that aren't leftist, you really don't understand this stuff. And I think that um, it just needs to be explained in a way that is very simple and clear for people, because once you lay it out that simply, people do start to see it. Um, like, I, I think a lot of people do understand the oppressor versus oppressed narrative. Um, but like, I think they also need to go that next step further to understand that the left believes that all oppression is created by capitalism. And if they can just abolish capitalism, then that will get rid of all oppression. And so that's the thing that's not, I think, clear. And the reason, again, that I think this, this is important to understand is capitalism for the left is not just an economic system. Capitalism is everything. Capitalism is America. That is what the American dream is. When they're saying capitalism, they're referring to the capitalist U.S. government. They want to abolish our entire government. They want to abolish the Constitution. They want to abolish the court system. They want to abolish the police. That was just the one that I was going to get into, um, which we can still talk about if you guys want to. I can maybe still go, go there after I hear what Nick has to say. Um, they want to abolish everything. And, and everything they're doing from like people would people often ask they're like well why do they have all these different words that mean capitalism why do all these things just mean the same thing because it's like they're they're attacking capitalism from as many vectors as they can and it's kind of like if you have an enemy do you just go right at that enemy or do you try to surround them and attack that enemy from the top, the side, diagonal, below? Like, do you try to attack that enemy from as many angles as possible? Well, if you have the ability to do so, you attack that enemy from as many angles as possible. And that is explicitly what the left is doing with all this language that all references back to capitalism. And people need to know that. This is important. This is the country. Um, Nick, what do you have to say about all this? Uh, I was just trying to chime in too, like, girl, we can hear you, but since I'm on spot now, um, but you mentioned whiteness and blackness. Uh, I also want to point out they are using the term anti blackness. I've only heard it with black people, so you can correct me if you heard it other places. But the context that I heard it in was like anti blackness means basically it's you're against socialism. They they entertain it with anti blackness and anti racism and all that stuff. But I'll add that a lot of communists believe. Except for like ones and twos, he said pretty much black people belong to socialism or they are naturally socialist. He can correct me if I'm wrong on that, Carolyn. But uh, I that's just I wanted to put that in there since you mentioned whiteness and blackness. Yeah, I think that that's um, a, a really good point, Nick. And and so, yeah, that, that so I have the same understanding of the term like anti-blackness as you do. It essentially means anti-socialism because the left does believe that basically all black people should be socialist because they believe that all black people are like inherently impressed by society. So they really do get pissed off when black people are not leftists. Um, like, for example, like how many black black owned businesses did they burn down during the 2020 riots, which were supposedly about Black Lives Matter? Well, they don't want black people owning private businesses that's engaging in capitalism that's that's uh, assimilating to whiteness and that is that's not what they want this is why they call people like larry elder the black face of a uh white supremacy this is why they call jay-z a white supremacist it's why they call kanye west a white supremacist james over on youtube my mic sounds fine to me if other people have issues with my microphone you need to let me know but it sounds fine to me so it might just be yours or it might be the fact that nick's mic was extra loud you're gonna have to deal with the sound bro i can't fix everything all the time and it sounds fine to me um so yeah i do have that uh, kind of same understanding of you in regards to um what anti-blackness means let me see i have someone else requesting Dragon Tales coming up. And I can keep walking through some of these attributes, but I definitely want to encourage anyone who has questions about any of this, please make sure to grab a mic, come up, have a conversation with me. I can turn my mic up a little bit more if people are louder than me that are callers. Dragon Tail, what do you have to say? Well, I wanted to ask you a question because, you know, this comes up a lot on Twitter when we try to debunk people that say... For example, when Trump says that Kamala is a comrade or a Marxist, and I'm always saying, you know, she's not a Marxist. Democrats are not communist. At the same time, how do you handle people when or when you actually see 
and this is also kind of a question. When Democrats do borrow particular talking points that do align with socialist values, or when you hear um, you know, Kamala wanting to defund police, or she's done things in the past where she's helped out people who've been arrested by Black Lives Matter, uh, things about universal health care. Is it that the Dems are using particular talking points to pander to the left, or is it that the left has slowly been co-opting Dems? How do you tackle the idea when Dems do start aligning more and more with particular talking points of socialists, while at the same time we're trying to tell them they're not socialists? Because for me, the biggest thing is that most Democrats that I hear still participate in capitalism and want to uphold capitalism. And I'm not sure if Democrats really understand how capitalism is defined by the socialists. So could you clarify that a little bit when it comes to trying to debunk people on Twitter? Yeah, I think that's a uh, great question. I hope the mic is a little bit louder for people on uh, on YouTube now. Um, so, 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 okay, so first... Um, I'm going to tackle this from a number of different angles. So first of all, people need to understand that we are talking about distinct groups of people and that we can't, it, it does not benefit us to classify as all people in the same just because sometimes they use the same language because most of the times they don't. So Democrats are not the same as progressives. Progressives are further left than Democrats. Um, progressives are not the same as democratic socialists. Democratic socialists are farther left than progressives. And then real socialists, real communists are not the, even the same as democratic socialists. Real socialists and communists don't even allow their members to be uh, members of the Democratic Socialists of America because they believe the Democratic Socialists of America are too close to capitalism. So the differences between um, Democrats and uh, progressives and Democratic Socialists and real radical socialists and real communists is that real socialists and real communists are want to abolish capitalism. This is what their primary goal is. This is everything they do. This is every strategy they're undertaking. Democrats do not want to abolish capitalism. Progressives don't want to abolish capitalism. Even democratic socialists, they may be okay with abolishing. Like they they're they're like they're like namby pamby about it. They're kind of like, you know, they're they're trying to like um make marginal gains against capitalism, but according to again real socialists, they're still too capitulated to capitalism in order to actually um abolish the system. Um so this actually this information comes as a surprise to a lot of people. They think that um the farthest left people are are Bernie Sanders and AOC and the squad and things like that. Real communists and Marxists in the United States actually overtly denounce Bernie Sanders and the squad. And they overtly denounce Kamala Harris, too. I mean, we saw that in the DNC. There, there were these massive protests by leftists. There were significantly more leftist protesters in Chicago outside the Democratic National Convention than there was in Milwaukee outside the Republican National Convention because real leftists hate the Democratic Party far more than they hate the Republican Party. Now, that's said. You are absolutely correct that you can kind of see trickle down policies and trickle down language that um, that does come from the far left that makes its way into the Democratic Party that shows up every now and again. So defunding the police and like a Kamala Harris bailing protesters out of jail um, during the 2020 riots, that's like a trickle down from the far left. That doesn't mean Kamala Harris is a communist. It just means that for that one moment, she was uh, kind of pandering to the to the left she was i mean they, like listen the 2020 protests were a massive political moment and that was the point of them like protests are a way that the left uh, gets attention and they it's a way they advance their policies kamala harris is kind of a useful idiot progressive opportunist that saw an opportunity to pander to a leftist base that was protesting in huge numbers nationally and so she did it but does Kamala Harris want to abolish the police? No, Kamala Harris does not want to abolish the police. Kamala Harris does not want to abolish prisons. Kamala Harris was a she was a she was a DA. She was a prosecutor. And so they like like that's actually one of the reasons that real socialists hate Kamala Harris is because um is because she she was a prosecutor. Like she put people in jail. She is a cop according to them. And cops are like the number one enemy of the far left. If I can just go into like how does abolish the police relate to capitalism real quick? I just, I I think this is important for the question that you ask. So what the left believes, and again, I referenced that sign that's floating around on libs of TikTok earlier today that said that uh, the police are descendant from slave catchers. What the left believes is that slavery in the United States literally created the current incarnation of the police. 
that the police are managers of private property, that the only job the police has in, is in order to protect the private property of the bourgeois. In this case, the, the literal runaway slaves, which again, slavery was considered uh, to be private property ownership, and that in a world built on equity, which Marxism means equity, we would have no need for the police because there would be no more private property and everyone would have access to everything they need. So does Kamala Harris want to abolish the police? Does she want to defund the police? No. But she does want to pander to the far left when she has the opportunity to do so. Has Kamala Harris used the term equity? Well, yeah, she has. Absolutely. And Kamala Harris actually used the term equity correctly to mean that everyone has it is like an unequal distribution of resources based on what people, quote unquote, need. That is definitely a trickle down from the left. That doesn't make Kamala Harris a communist because I don't even think Kamala Harris understands the logical end conclusion of, of what she wants. I think that it's just like a nice talking point that kind of panders to the left just enough, but still... We see leftists showing up at her protest. The, the Palestinian protesters were showing up at her protest. What did Kamala Harris do when she was face to face with actual leftists at her protests? She told them to shut up and go away. Like literally, this is on video for people who haven't seen it. Kamala Harris told real leftist protesters to shut up and go away. Another thing I would point is that um, is that Kamala Harris's husband, Doug Emhoff, actually gave a speech at one of her rallies where he where he explicitly said Kamala Harris is pro capitalism. Now, trust me, like if you have spent any time listening to the left with me, you know that even to pander, this would never come out of a socialist mouth. They would never say that they are pro-capitalism, pro-communism. It would never happen. Like they would, they would probably sooner die. That would be saying you are pro-capitalism um, is like it, it is a betrayal. It is an inter it is you would become a traitor on the left by saying that. And so we have to kind of take it like how I think about it with um, Kamala Harris and with all these kind of like, you know, progressive and democratic politicians is politicians are going to do what they need to do in order to survive in office because that's how they make all their money. That's how they, how they have all their power. They do pander to the left and there are trickle down things that happen with the left, which is part of what makes the left so dangerous is they integrate into, I mean, to be honest, Kamala Harris probably has socialists working for her. That's how she's getting those ideas. It's not that she has those ideas. It's that people are working for her that are writing her speeches, that are telling her what to say, that are giving her those ideas. These are how these policies start to get integrated into more mainstream aspects of our society as they get into in, uh, uh, job positions under kind of like the head people and they start to put these ideas in there they start to change policy they make these small little incremental changes but that doesn't mean kamala harris is a communist and the last thing i'll say about this and then i do want to you know just again open the floor for questions it is so important that we understand this because when when hugely influential people like james lindsay like elon musk like donald trump like every other person who's been doing this, when they say over and over and over and over and over again, Kamala Harris is a communist, Kamala, Kamala Harris is a communist, Kamala Harris is a communist, Kamala Harris is a communist. What that means is the real communists, the real far left, the ones that are working in all your kids' schools, the ones that are in positions of institutional power in the federal government, the ones that are in the military, the ones that are in the news media, the ones that are in entertainment, all of the real far leftists in our society are operating completely unopposed because everyone is looking at Kamala Harris and believing that she represents the left. When again, anyone who has watched socialism with me knows that what real socialists do is so much more dangerous than anything Kamala Harris is even talking about. And so that's why I think this is really important that we're very specific about this. And I know it makes good conservative rhetoric and it gets all the stupid MAGA voters. No offense, MAGA voters, but a lot of you are stupid. If you're listening to me, you're probably smart. I'm not talking about you if you're listening to me. I'm saying a lot of MAGA voters are stupid and you say Kamala Harris is a communist and they go, yeah, and they start cheering and all this stuff. It gets people all fired up and you get positive feedback from it. But that you're actually you're basically signing your own death warrant when you say this. And I, and I hope people really mean that, because when you allow the left to operate completely unopposed, like th this is like they're 
like Republicans running around and conservatives running around saying Kamala Harris is a communist is like a wet dream for socialists and communists. This is their fantasy. This is allowing them to do everything they want to do without having anyone opposing them at all. And communists and socialists love it when you don't know what they're doing, when they're operating completely under the radar. This is how they have effectively taken over every institution in our society. Um, I want to bring up NeuroNerd, who just requested to uh, to speak, um, and we'll let him connect. Heidi, do you have something to say to that? Yeah, I just had a question. I mean, from, I mean, in your opinion, brother, um, and I mean, I, I kind of already know the answer for this, maybe, but, but I still want to hear you say it, uh, is um, if the left, if the, if the actual left is currently unopposed, um, you know, who actually is the real opposition to the left and who actually can take that on. I mean, if, I mean, and I kind of agree. I mean, most, you know, most, I think most Democrat and Republican voters are both, both pretty, you know, average um, intelligence and aren't really, you know, prepared to understand what's going on um, with the left. So who actually would be their enemy? Because I mean, when I was on the left, it was like, you don't really see, you don't really know like what the enemy was. I mean, you would say like conservatives maybe or Republicans or you call everybody fascist, you know, um, but you weren't, there wasn't really a clear enemy. The enemy becomes clear um, once there's like a revolution and there's a counter counter revolutionaries. Um, the only cool thing I've seen like kind of close to it is like Antifa versus Proud Boys, like that kind of dynamic, which a lot of that is like fake. And I don't think all of that is real, but I'm just curious, what do you think, you know, to go back, what do you think is, who do you think is actually poised to be the actual, um, you know, counter um, to the left currently, if it's not any of these people. I mean, Heidi, you've outlined why I spend so much time screaming about this stuff right now and why I drive myself crazy, literally repeating the same thing every day for years and years and years on end. It's that there is no current opposition to the left. There really isn't. Um, and, and that and that's terrifying to me because I watch what, what leftists are doing and there is there's no one opposing them and you know even um you know so so in in reality it really should be the political right it should be people who oppose like it should be every single person that opposes communism that opposes the uh, like far left political ideology that doesn't want to live in a communist world listen you don't have to love capitalism there are, there are problems with capitalism and i think we can all acknowledge that like there's crony capitalism there's corrupt capitalism i'm not suggesting those things are good but just because you oppose like distortions of capitalism doesn't mean that you should be in favor of abolishing capitalism in the way that the left is suggesting abolishing it because that's going to fuck up our entire way of life that's going to make us slaves essentially and so um i think that there are just not enough people that are saying you know that um that that this whole idea is wrong it is wrong to try to abolish private property it's wrong to abolish parental rights it's wrong to do all these things what we have is essentially the so the problem with the right is that they're just completely reactionary to whatever the left does and so whatever the left does the right is going to come out and scream and cry about how the left is bad and how they're all communists and how they're all this and how they're all that but the right has no opposing vision for what the left is doing the right isn't actually doing anything to um to articulate okay we don't like the left here's what we do want or we don't like the left and here's what we need to do to you know build a society that's going to be better for people um and stuff like that and so it's it, it's really mind boggling to watch because a lot of people are screaming on Twitter and a lot of people are making a lot of money sharing content that that claims to expose the left. But none of them are actually opposing the left in any real way. Even you get down to things like um like this campaign that Moms for Liberty has of getting people elected to school boards, like even things like that, because they do not understand how the system works is a fundamentally flawed thing, because in 48 out of 50 states in this country, school boards do not dictate curriculum. It's just fact. They don't dictate curriculum. And so, like, so you get a whole bunch of people elected to school boards, so what? The teachers are still the ones that are dictating the curriculum. And when that classroom door closes, the teachers are going to teach whatever the flip they want. And there's nothing really that the school board can do about it. And so um, that's part of why I spend so much time saying that 
people need to go back to basics and they need to learn what the left is actually doing because because there's so much misinformation on the right and there's so much of a propensity to engage in just like outrage porn and fear mongering and stuff like that there is no concerted opposition to them now one of the things that i do see and this is part of why i'm friendly quite frankly with nick fuentes and and i don't agree with nick fuentes on a lot of things by the way just so so people are very clear which i always have to say which is stupid because like no one should really agree with everyone on everything but what i can say about nick and the groipers is that they are making a concerted effort to infiltrate in institutions to take them back they are actually v highly strategic and highly pragmatic in how they're going about things they might be outlandish on twitter and they might be a pain in the ass on twitter but nick does have a long-term vision for this country and nick has i think what is probably the most strategic plan that i've heard of in in insofar as what i've heard him say on his show um to design to over the long term kind of regain control of things now will it work i have no idea but i think that nick fuentes influencing the direction of what the so-called like conservative movement is i think that's only a positive thing even if i don't agree with him on a lot of things and even though i think he might be a little bit misguided on some things and he's a he's a young man and so he's doing these outlandish thought exercises that rile people up online but when you actually listen to him i think he could be an opposing force for the left and so that's one of the reasons that i'm friendly with him and the gripers does that make sense heidi what do you think yeah, no, it does make a lot of sense. I mean, you know, it's frustrating. I mean, in some ways, I actually think Democrats combat the far left better than the right does sometimes. I mean, what do you think about that? That thought? Well, because like pro pro capitalist Democrats would say like, you know, like a moderate Democrat. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's true because I think that, that, again, like I say, like socialists hate the Democrats way more than they hate the conservatives. They complain about the Democrats all the time in like every presentation they do. And it's like they actually did um, a couple like I've seen actually two different leftist presentations in the past couple of weeks called the lesser of two evilisms, where they're basically saying F Kamala Harris, we're not going to vote for the lesser of two evils. These people all suck. We hate her. And uh, and so they yeah, I, I think that the Democrats actually do in some respects, stand in the way of the far left um, far more than conservatives do. You're right about that. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Hey, thank you. Hey, I want to uh, welcome NeuroNerd up to the stage. NeuroNerd, what do you have to say? I'm um, sorry. I'm just finishing something up right now. I'll, I'll come back and speak. All right. That sounds good. Um, guys, if you just got here, um, I'm actually recording an episode of my Actively Unwoke podcast right now. You can find the podcast at carlin.substack.com. You can also download it on Apple uh, Podcasts and also Spotify as well. And um, if you guys appreciate what I'm doing, I hope you'll consider supporting my work over on the Substack. Um, you can sign up for a membership over there. I'm doing a series of podcasts that are basically explaining my intellectual criticisms of James Lindsay and his work. Um, that's what we're doing here today um, because James James Lindsay has been making all these wild character attacks against me and and I'm not going to engage in character attacks. I'm not going to fling slurs around like he is. Um, he actually tweeted about me this morning saying that the only reason I'm making intellectual criticisms of his work is because I quote unquote want him, which was a new one for me. Um, but uh, but what I'm doing is a series of spaces to lay out what I think people need to understand about the far left, how it shows up in our world, what they need to understand about cultural Marxism in the United States for those of you who might be new to me this is because i've spent the last three and a half years listening to literally thousands of hours of far left training um i do this publicly on my youtube and rumble channels um you're welcome to follow along um i want to go over to nick nick i see you raised your hand do you have something to uh contribute yeah i'll just add on to what heidi said about the, the democrats are the, the, the biggest threat to uh to the economy besides capitalism which is the number one evil they consider the evil of all veins but um, if you looked at, like, between the protests of the DNC and the RNC, they had, like, maybe, what, a couple thousand at the RNC? They didn't seem really enthused. They are just there, like, yeah, we're protesting. At least that's my impression of it. But when we went to their, their, their private chats that, that, we, that you infiltrated, they were fucking psyched for the DNC. Too. And they, they, should, they had, like, what, 50,000 plus? Granted, it was in Chicago, which is, like, one of their home turf and all that. But they were like, yeah, we're going to do this. Uh, quite honestly, I thought at one point, I thought a riot was going to break out for, for a second there. But then they kind of like, no, 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 we're going to tame it down just a little bit. Not enough to get us arrested. So I think someone were hoping to get arrested. But yeah, they 
hate the Democrats, and they don't really care about the conservatives. They're like, yeah, we don't care because they confused us with the Democrats. And we're okay with that. Yeah, thanks for that, Nick. I, I appreciate that. Um, I want to address something that, so I'm, I'm simulcasting this on my YouTube channel right now. There's someone over on my YouTube channel called Meow Rar, Rar Growl who says, the queer activists don't have kids, and even for those that do, usually abandon or abort them. I need to address this. This is completely false, guys. This is just completely false. Like, and this is again, this is a this is a conservative interpretation of the left that is based on bullshit, that's based on outrage porn, that's based on clickbait. We watch queer activists on my channel all the time, and a lot of them have kids. The fact of the matter is that a lot of socialists are second and third generation socialists that are born of socialists who teach them how to be socialists. I actually have, and I need to put this on my Substack. I've been um I've been um, you know, kind of dragging my feet on this for a while i actually have the documents that outline an entire socialist child care program that i got from the socialism 2023 conference when i went undercover at it where basically not only do socialists and queer activists have kids they have entire child care programs that are set up to indoctrinate those kids to be future socialists they set up the child care programs at their meetings they play socialist games with the kids they actually have different socialist versions of games like monopoly like monopoly is all about capitalism right monopoly is about competition and socialists don't like competition and they certainly don't like capitalism so they actually created their own version of monopoly i think it's called communopoly where it's all about teaching kids how to share resources and be part of the collective and things like that so no this is fundamentally untrue and the thing of it is is in the reason i'm specifically bringing this up is because if concern and, and and Tim Pool is like one of the kings of doing this too. I won't just pick on James Lindsay. I'll I'll pick on Tim Pool as well because Tim Pool is also massively uninforming his audience about what's going on. Tim Pool, I've heard um, people tell me he says that you know leftists are just going to abort all their kids and so there won't be any leftists and so they're just aborting their political ideology. First of all, no, they're not. Secondly, just because they're fighting for reproductive justice, that's what they call abortion. That doesn't mean that all leftists are aborting their kids, but more importantly, the left owns the public schools. So even if they were aborting all their kids, they're taking yours and you're not doing anything about it. So can we please, and I understand, I really do understand that conservatives love owning the libs more than they love anything in this world. The conservatives love owning the libs more than they actually love the United States of America. I'm actually convinced of that because every time conservatives do this kind of like bullshit thing where they're owning the libs, what they're doing is they're just spreading like bullshit talking points about the left that, that aren't grounded into reality at all, but it makes conservatives feel morally superior and that's really all they're looking for. And in the meantime, the left just keeps winning. The left just keeps taking things over. The left just keeps making progress. What is really accomplished with these owning the lib talking points that are completely unhinged from reality? So I understand, meow, rar, rar, growl, that you probably were told that by someone that you trust to inform you. But the fact is, and again, this is part of my issue with the, with the right, is that a lot of influencers, it's not just James Lindsay, it's not just Tim Pool, a lot of influencers are completely misinforming their audiences about what the left is doing. And that's not their audience's fault. If this is the first time that you've heard any of these ideas that I'm articulating because you've been listening to the wrong people, that's not your fault, okay? That's their fault. That's their fault for not taking the time to understand what they are saying, to not understand what they're teaching people, and to quite frankly, not even have any desire to adhere to the truth or what's going on. But once you understand that these people have been lying to you about what the left is, you've got to stop listening to them. You know, people ask me all the time, they're like, what can we do to fight back against the left? Can you give us something to do? Okay, we've accepted that our influencers are lying to us. What does that mean? What can we do to fight back? What you need to do, and this is what a lot of people don't want to do, but this is absolutely required if you want to win. What you need to do is unlearn everything you think you know about the left. And you need to start again from scratch. And I'll help you do that. And I know that this is what you need to do because I had to do the same thing. Members of my community had to do the same thing. I've been on a three plus year journey, three and a half year journey now of unlearning everything I thought I knew about the left. And I came from the left. 
And I still had to unlearn a lot. And I had to unlearn everything I learned from every conservative influencer I interacted with in 2020 and the beginning of 2021. I had to unlearn everything and then build back up from scratch. And so there are so many people who are in my community that have been in my community for a long time that had to do exactly the same thing. And it sucks. It sucks to realize how much you've been lied to by people that you trusted to inform you. And I'm really sorry about that, but there's nothing I can do other than show you that the real left is is not what they say it is. It's significantly worse than they say it is. And again, I will walk you through different things. I will show you their trainings. I have different I have a class called How to Speak Socialist over on my Substack. That's Carlin K A R L Y N dot Substack dot com. You just go to the section called How to Speak Socialist. It's the first link at the top of the page. And in that training, this is a four hour it's a free class. You don't have to pay money for it or anything. It's two two hour videos and it will walk you through dozens of clips from far left trainings so that you can see explicitly what the left says and then I explain to you what all that means and I've heard over and over again from people who do that training that it was one of the biggest wake up calls they got about what the left is doing and they learned how much their influencers hadn't told them and how much they needed to know in order to actually effectively fight back because the thing is I can give you a list of tactics I literally wrote a book with li with four chapters of checklists about tactics tactics. But if you don't understand the enemy that you're fighting, you, you will never implement these tactics correctly. So that's why it's so necessary just to start at the beginning, to go back and to learn and to relearn everything you think you know. And I understand that I might not be the best teacher for everyone. I understand that some people don't like my tone. They don't like my voice. They don't like any of these things. Um, but, you know, <laughs> you know, I can't control any of that. What I can control is, is that I will, I will give you all the primary source information and then you can decide for yourself what you think of it. And if, uh, if you don't like my tone, that's fine. Like whatever. Um, anyway, I want to invite anyone up to, uh, speak that wants to kind of, uh, grab a mic neuro nerd. I don't know if you're ready to chat yet, but just let me know, uh, when you are. Otherwise I can go talk about some other things about the left and how it relates back to, uh, to capitalism, which is kind of the main topic and the abolition of capitalism. But I'm just going to do a quick pause and see if anyone else wants to uh, chime in here that's already on the stage. No, I, I think we go on. Okay. So I'm going to keep going. So I have a couple more things I want to talk about. So for people who may have joined late, we are talking about how the primary goal of the left is to abolish capitalism. And I'm, I'm showing you how there are um, like everything the left does relates back to the primary goal of abolishing capitalism. Again, capitalism is defined as private property ownership. Um, we've already talked about what that means. If you joined late, you're going to have to wait for the replay. I, very, I, I apologize. If you have questions at any point, please feel free to grab a mic, come up to the stage and talk to me. I would love to have a conversation. Let's talk about gender ideology. So gender ideology goes under a variety of names on the left. Um, you might know it as queer theory. You might know it as queer Marxism. Um, this is about like, quote unquote, transing kids, although it's not really about transing kids. So so what does gender have to do? This also relates back to a uh, drag queen story hour and things like that. So what does gender have to do with abolishing capitalism, which is private property ownership? So what the left believes is, is that capitalism created the gender binary. The gender binary is men and women. That's what the binary is. Capitalism created that by putting men in the workplace where they got all the money and they had access to all the power while women stayed in the home doing the unpaid labor of raising the nuclear family. So that created a hierarchy between men and women. That hierarchy is also known as the patriarchy. The left believes that the, the primary goal of gender ideology is not actually to trans anything. It's not, it's not to get people, whether they're kids or not, to transition from man to woman or woman to man because that still upholds the thing that creates a hierarchy or the patriarchy between men and women. Okay, What the left actually wants to do is abolish the gender binary entirely. Because abolishing the gender binary entirely would get rid of the thing that creates oppression in the first place. They would get rid of the thing that creates the hierarchy. And that is always what the left is trying to do. They're trying to uh, get rid of all the hierarchies because hierarchies inherently create oppression. 
So abolishing the gender binary is the way that they want to achieve what they call gender equity. That is the primary goal of queer theory. That is also, by the way, the primary goal of things like Drag Queen Story Hour. Drag Queen Story Hour is not about sexualizing children. I'm not saying that ch uh, child sexualization never happens, but people need to understand that it's a very, 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 very small sliver of the overall problem of what the left is doing with gender. And I'm not saying you shouldn't pay attention to it. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm not saying that you shouldn't help kids when they're in that sort of situation. Not saying any of that. But right now what's going on on the right is that everyone thinks that gender ideology is about sexualizing kids. And the fact of the matter is it's just not. And um, so the real goal is to abolish the gender binary entirely. Drag Queen Story Hour is about teaching kids that uh, changing your gender is as easy as changing your outfit. It's if you put on a sparkly dress, you are suddenly a girl. That's what that's about. It's not about sexualizing them. It's about teaching them that gender isn't a real thing, that it's a social construct, that it is fluid, that you can easily change it by putting on a dress or putting on a suit and tie or things like that. That's what they're trying to do. They are trying to create an, a population that considers themselves to be outside the gender binary. This is why they're teaching this to kids in school. Because if they can teach this to kids in school by the time they're eight years old, which they are teaching it that young, then that's going to cement in those kids' brain. It's going to be there for the rest of their life. Even if they don't get them by the time they're eight years old, if you teach a teenager that's going few, uh, through puberty that the reason that they feel awkward is because they don't adhere to any specific gender stereotypes and that they're non-binary, that's going to stick with them. And then they're going to go, oh, I must be non-binary. That's why I'm so weird. Everyone feels weird in puberty. The left takes advantage of that. They specifically target autistic ch uh, children. I've done a lot of work exposing different autistic sex ed trainings. You can find that on my YouTube channel. You can find it on my Substack, where they're teaching kids essentially that gender does not exist. So the term non-binary literally means no binary. When you hear someone using they, them pronouns, or even she, they pronouns, or he, they pronouns, what they're telling you is that they are outside of the gender binary. They are not adhering to that. And that is the goal of the far left, is to create an entire population of non-binary people. Now, one more thing on this. And we're not going to do a deep dive into reproductive justice. Again, reproductive justice is what the left calls abortion. Um, we're not going to do a deep dive in this, but what I will tell you is that the reason that the left loves abortion so much is because abortion liberates women from being in the gender binary because what they believe is, again, the gender binary puts women in the home doing the unpaid labor of raising the nuclear family. They also consider the nuclear family to be the next generation of proletarian workers. And so if they have abortion, then they are liberated from the gender binary because they don't have to have kids. That is part of the reason they're doing that, because attacking the nuclear family is the next thing that the left wants to do. And that's the last thing I'll talk about today is specifically how does abolishing the nuclear family relate back to capitalism? Let me take a sip of my coffee real quick. So I do think a lot of people understand that um, that. Well, so Olis over on uh, YouTube says, I'm still puzzled that these ideas gain traction. Well, the ideas gain traction because they're taught in elementary school. Anything that you learn in school, if that's the majority of what you're, of what you're learning, that's going to gain traction because you don't know anything else. And so when this is reinforced at every level of your schooling, in every subject matter, because it's not just taught in one or two subject matters, it's taught in all subject matters, not all the time, but like they trickle in information all throughout schooling and stuff like that. You're constantly around people who are reinforcing the ideas. Then you go to college and college is like next level leftist indoctrination. And leftists too, leftists have this weird subculture thing where they really only hang around other leftists. They only talk to other leftists. They only read at leftist books. They only go to leftist events. So there's this entire ecosystem that's being created where all of these ideas are the normal. I think conservatives really need to understand that. Conservatives are not in the leftist ecosystem. The leftist ecosystem Everything that I'm explaining right now is completely normal. Heidi was talking about this earlier. 
Heidi knows all of this because she used to be a Democrat. She went to a far left college. Like all of this is like, yeah, this is absolutely what they believe. Th these are normal ideas. So conservatives might go, that's crazy. Well, saying that's crazy is not going to convince a leftist because to them, that's normal. To them, conservative ideas are crazy, just like to conservatives, leftist ideas are crazy because both of these groups, and I'm not meaning any offense when I say this, but both of these groups exist in echo chambers, okay? All right, I want to talk about this last one, how the nuclear family relates back to abolishing capitalism, which again, abolishing capitalism is always the primary goal of the left. So here is what the left believes. They believe in a thing called social reproduction theory. Social reproduction theory says that social systems will reproduce themselves until they are disrupted. What does that mean? Capitalism is not an economic system. Capitalism is our culture. That's how they view it. Capitalism is our society. Everything in our society runs to support capitalism. Capitalism is going to continue to reproduce itself until it's disrupted. One of the ways that capitalism is continuing to reproduce itself in America is through the nuclear family. Because when you have children and you raise them to have capitalist values in the United States, that inherently reproduces capitalism because they don't know anything differently. So in order to abolish capitalism, then the left needs to abolish the nuclear family because they believe that the nuclear family is literally reproducing capitalism. They believe that children are the future oppressed workers in our society. They believe that children, because of parental rights, are considered to be the private property of their parents. They liken it to slavery. You know how we talked about slavery earlier is, is basically a private property argument that people were owned as private property. Socialists believe, and by the way, I use the term socialist, communist, and Marxist pretty interchangeably because the left uses them interchangeably. There are nuances, but we don't care about those right now. Socialists believe that parental rights mean that parents own their children as private property, just like slave owners own slaves. And so that's why you're seeing all these attacks on parental rights happen, because they are trying to, quote unquote, liberate children from the ownership of their parents. And they're doing this specifically with the intent of disrupting the nuclear family, because the nuclear family is the means of reproduction of capitalism. They're doing other things to try to disrupt the nuclear family, too. They're doing polyamory. They're, I mean, teaching about queer in schools. Queer theory and gender ideology is intimately linked to the disruption of the nuclear family. If you abolish the gender binary, like we talked about earlier, that is inherently going to lead to the, the uh, abolition of the nuclear family um, because you're going to have to create all these families of choice and things like that. Um, that's maybe something we can get into in a future podcast. But that is how abolishing the nuclear family relates back to the primary goal of abolishing capitalism. And I could go on and on and on. I could talk about how universal health care is all about abolishing capitalism because they believe that capitalism and which is the privatization of health care is causing disparities in health coverage. And so they believe that they can fix that by abolishing capitalism entirely. Environmental justice is all about capitalism because they believe that capitalism is the thing that is creating the environmental crisis. Capitalism incentivizes businesses to, um, to destroy the environment, essentially. And so if we just abolish capitalism, we will achieve environmental justice. Everything the left doing, is it goes back to this one goal. And so if you understand this, this is your key to the kingdom to understanding the left. And that's really all I have, guys. I've been talking for a while now. Um, I just want to do one last call. If anyone wants to come up and ask questions or give your point of view, I definitely want to uh, allow people to do that. If people have questions on YouTube, I just want to make a quick pause and see if uh, people have questions there. And if not, we'll wrap up. But does anyone who's a speaker on the space right now, do any of you guys have anything else to say? Uh, yeah, I'll just touch back real quick about the language. Sorry, I should have said this earlier. For everybody here, if you don't know a language, if you learn their language, I mean, you learn it, you can point it out, you can break it down, that scares the shit out of the communists. I've had so many communists who try to point out that they're not kind of use of this language, and I point out, and I broke it down, they were real quick to end the conversation and block my ass, because they don't want no one else realizing that people understand language, and they will run like crazy. 
if you figure out their language. All right, Nick, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Uh, Dragon Taylor, Heidi, do you guys have anything else? And if you don't, that's cool. Heidi? You know, I did on your last point, and now I can't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> like, before you did your last point, I had something I thought of, and now I'm like, hmm. But, no, I mean, awesome talk. I mean, I guess I would just say as, you know, somebody that has been on the left, um, you know, the points that you're making are are super clear. I mean, it's exactly what they think. And, oh, oh, that's what it is. It was the normal thing. Okay, so... So from a leftist perspective, yes, like the entire world, or at least like, I mean, yeah, almost the entire world is set up incorrectly to them, you know? And so that's the framework that they're looking at. So that everything that, you know, is in capitalism and just normal society, that's wrong. Like that's wrong. And that's where all our problems stem from, you know? And so their thoughts are normal, like actually, no, we need communism. We need the government to take care of us. We need all this stuff and it'll fix everything. Like all your stress, all your worries, like every problem that you have in society, like that actually will fix it. And the whole thing is the system is completely set up wrong. And so from their frame of mind, yeah, they're in an echo chamber and that's all normal. And then any, and if you say something like, you know, no, actually the nuclear family's good. They're like, oh my God, you know, you're <laughs> like, like that's like that's literally your problem is like, you know, you you need to be in this egalitarian, like utopian society that I've we've created in our mind. Um, that doesn't exist in reality. But um, yeah, I wanted to say something on that, just just on the concept of normality, because that's huge um to the left, you know, heteronormativity um basically means like you're you're nor you're making something normal that actually goes against what they think is true human nature and the forcing it to be normal and normalizing it you know normalizing these things that are actually causing you you know grief and strife and you're not able to be your full you know whatever queer self or whatever it is um that's really kind of where their mindset is so, like it is you know it, it's just something to keep in mind when you're trying to have these discussions if you're trying to have them which they're not they're not really easy to have yeah and i would say too and and, and again this is really important especially for more right leaning people to understand because they think that conservatives and right leaning people are in a cult just as much as you guys think they are in a cult okay and so you cannot defeat the left by saying here is what like I think your ideas are crazy you can't defeat the left by making fun of them you can't defeat the left by um by saying you know have you have you thought about like the logical conclusions of your ideas and how that and have you thought about here's the here's the typical one do you know real communism has never been tried do, do you guys think the left hasn't heard that before the like I, I hear that almost every single day in my life because people think I'm a socialist because I understand them but like like none of these things is actually going to defeat the left and the thing of it is too is I'm not even actually convinced that it's productive to have a conversation with the left in terms of like trying to debunk their ideas because I think I, I really do I mean th this like I actually really do think that they've been indoctrinated into a cult I think they've been indoctrinated into a cult via the public schools that um that this cult is constantly reinforcing the mindset that it's really difficult to um to be able to get them to see outside of that mindset which again it's kind of like it's a sad thing right because I and I know a lot of people like to make fun of the left but this but it is a sad thing like when you see the campus protesters today you have to understand that Every single one of those kids that's engaging in those campus protests has been indoctrinated into a cult of the left since they were five years old. They're victims of this ideology. They are victims of this. It's not something that they created. It's not something that they advanced. It's something that they got indoctrinated into via the public school system, quite frankly, because people didn't know what was going on. Like people only relatively yeah. recently became aware of this. Heidi, what do you have to say? Um, yeah, I mean, just as far as the college goes, I mean, it can be faster than that in college. Like, they don't even have to have been indoctrinated, like, in public schools necessarily, because college is so, they're so good at what they do. And your entire friend group might be leftist. And that's, like, really hard to fight against. I mean, that's kind of what happened to me is that, you know, I met some friends and I was like, oh, yeah, cool. We have some common interests. And they're like, yeah, we like to go to raves and, and do this stuff and, like, whatever, smoke weed, hang out, just normal normal young adult stuff and also we're like leftist you know and like oh you're only a democrat well we're gonna you're gonna be a leftist by the time we get done with you and they would you know and literally they would we would have these like conversations and while we're like hanging out and smoking weed and doing whatever 
And it's like, that's the environment that you're in in college. It's a totally immersive environment. Um, so, I mean, it is, it is cultish and it's also like, you don't want to lose your friends. Like that's the thing with these young people is like, it's, it's really like, do you want to be cool? And a lot of these kids have never been cool or felt like they had friends like that until they get to school. And they're like, yeah, you're with us now. Okay. You're, you know, you're a socialist now, or you're whatever, you're a leftist now with us and you're going to go to these protests. And that's really how it is. I mean, it's fully, fully immersive and encompassing. And even for somebody who didn't really get exposed to that, it can be very, I don't know, alluring, I guess, or like intoxicating uh, when you get into that environment. And it seems like it makes sense. And everybody that's smart is saying it makes sense. Your professors are saying it makes sense. You know, like the person you have a crush on says it makes sense. You go to parties, you know, and people say it, it's just everywhere around you. So it's, it's pervasive. Yeah, Heidi, I think that that's a really great point. And just to um to uh, elaborate on that um real quick, I think that, oh, shit, I had something really profound to say, and now it's just flown out of my head. I swear to God, it was really profound. It's going to come back in a second. I swear to God. So where, where, where did Heidi just go? Like everyone, you know, in college is, um, is, is doing these ideas and, oh, that, this is where I was going to go. So again, like, so for, again, for people who don't know, I've gone undercover at leftist events. They're really fun. They're really fun. And I say that as someone who, like, I oppose every single thing about these people's ideas. But let me tell you about the difference between going undercover at leftist events and pretending I'm a leftist to be there and dressing like them and acting like them and all that stuff. And what I experienced at conservative events as someone who I'm, I'm not a conservative, but I, I definitely have more um, probably in common with conservatives in terms of my ideology than I do with the left. Like at leftist events, I was welcomed in. It didn't matter what I looked like. You could see some of the craziest looking people in the world and everyone's just going to be accepted and no one's going to call you names and no one's going to make you feel bad for how you look or if you're overweight or if you have tattoos or if you you know have a disability or any of these things everyone treats you very nicely you are welcomed into the community they do fun things they have fun social outings they um you know like it, it's like they have like all these different ways that you can connect with people and meet people and make friends and connect with people that you go you know around like you that live around you to connect with after the event and stuff like that it is fun do not underestimate this and and what i would say about conservative events and i've been to cpac twice i've been to a bunch of different conservative events i used to go to them a lot more than i do now but i used to go to a lot of them and um i will say i always felt like i stuck out it as, as a th sore thumb at conservative events i always felt as though they were judging me for my appearance like i wasn't the right weight i didn't have the right haircut i had tattoos i looked weird and like they were always judging me for that there were always these snide comments made about my looks i I never felt accepted. I never felt like I was even even when I was like the conservative darling and I was being kind of lifted up as like the Democrat who left the left or like whatever. Even then it was like I was always kind of on the outs and the interactions were always weird because I had a different fashion sense than they did and I had a different haircut than they did. That doesn't happen at leftist events, guys. It really just doesn't. And I'm not trying to make conservatives feel bad at all. But I am trying to articulate to people that if you've got a young person that maybe has a little bit of like they're, they're messing around with fashion and they have a funny haircut and maybe they dyed it pink because they thought it was fun. I used to dye my hair all the time. My hair's dyed right now. My hair is dyed bright red right now. And it's like it, it, and so it's like you may have someone who's just like playing around with what they look like because that's fun to do sometimes. If they go to more right-leaning events, they're going to stick out like a sore thumb. People are going to be suspicious of them. They're not going to be nice to them. They're going to make fun of them for their haircut. God forbid they're overweight. You will, like, trust me, as someone who is not thin, I never stop hearing about my weight from the right. Never, ever, 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 ever. My weight seems to trump every other contribution I make. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating about that. I literally get called fat by a conservative every day of my life and I have for the past four and a half years and again I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad because I don't think you know well maybe there are people here who did that to me I don't know but it's not actually the point the point is which group is making people feel welcome which group is having more fun which group is more appealing to be a part of and that is how they're recruiting people that is how they get people involved in their culture because we don't want to hang around people. They're calling us fat and ugly and making fun of us and making us feel weird. Everyone just wants to be accepted at the end of the day. And like Heidi said, like a lot of these kids are they're like they were awkward people. 
They weren't always accepted. They weren't the popular kids in school. They go to leftist events. All of a sudden, they're accepted. They're welcomed and all this stuff. And that's that's how they create this tight-knit social system that really advances this far-left ideology. And as Heidi said, it's just as much a social system as it is about the political ideology. A lot of these people will never leave the left because if they leave the left, they have to leave all their friends. Some of them have to leave their family. Some of them, again, I said this earlier, they're second or third generation leftists. They literally have to leave their family if they are leaving the left. So it's not just as simple as saying, you know, real communism has never been tried, right? That's not going to work if you're talking about someone literally uprooting every social aspect of their lives and having to start over again. Hope that makes sense. Um, let me see. I saw a, a chat on the YouTube, in the YouTube chat. I just want to go back to it. Olis Paz on YouTube says, am I right to think that the numbers of people transmitting these ideas are small? No. <laughs> or are they saturated in our system now? I believe strongly that there are way more radical revolutionary socialists and communists in this country than people think. And just because I say the Democrats and progressives are not socialists, that does not mean that I think that socialists are a small number. I think that there are thousands of socialist cells all over this country that are organizing at a local level. Um, I think that they do their best to communicate with each other through online means and different events. We're actually going to be going inside a socialist recruiting call on Wednesday. I'm doing a spy stream about that. So if you want to know what socialists actually talk about on their recruiting calls, I will quite literally show you that. But I think there are more of these people than most people think. I do not believe it is a small and significant number. Um, I believe so. Okay. So the socialism 2024 conference just happened in Chicago a couple weeks ago. There were just as many far left radical revolutionary socialists at that conference as there are conservatives at CPAC. Think about that for a second. The radical revolutionary socialist conference, the most far left conference in this country is just as big as CPAC. That should terrify everyone. All right. Um, let me just scroll through the chat on YouTube, see if anyone has any more comments. If you have anything you'd like to say um, in, the, in the space, if people want to grab a mic and come up, I will uh, hang around for a couple more minutes. I'd love to hear your questions or your thoughts on any of this. Let me see. Jen X-Ray over on YouTube says, couldn't it be said that MAGA has been a cult or has profited off of keeping the cult going to promote masculine macho American identity hasn't helped to promote the left cult. Hasn't that helped promote the leftist cult enlistment? I mean, I will absolutely say that I think that there are a lot of MAGA voters that are acting like a cult. And I think that's been true for a while now. And, and I could also say the same was true of DeSantis voters during the primary for that matter. But listen, man, I've been attacked by Trump voters for saying things that they don't want to hear. I think we can all look at like, I'll even, I'll even depersonalize it for myself. Look what happened to Kyle Rittenhouse. Look what happened to Kyle Rittenhouse. When Kyle Rittenhouse said, I don't want to vote for Trump, I'm writing in Ron Paul. Kyle Rittenhouse was mobbed massively by the MAGA right. Don't tell me that there is an occult-like aspect to MAGA. There absolutely is. If you step out of line with what they want you to say or dare question anything that Trump says or does, they will attack you. I've seen it directly in my feed on more than one occasion. They act like they're innocent, but then they act exactly like the left does. So I do think that... Um, Again, like it's kind of like like and you could argue, you can make an argument that like all social systems are cults to a certain extent. So I don't again, I don't want MAGA voters to feel bad or anything, but um, I don't think MAGA is is as indoctrinated into MAGA as leftists and socialists are indoctrinated into the far left. I think these are two different things there. Like MAGA is more of like a political question after the election. The MAGA cult, I think, is going to dissolve anyway, because. Donald Trump will never run for office again after this presidential election. So it's kind of like the MAGA cult is going to have to dissolve. Um, but I, I, you know, I do think it absolutely has a cult like element. Let me see. Just going through my chat on YouTube. See if I have any more questions. I don't think it looks like I have any more questions. Hey, so I'm going to wrap up this space thing. because I'm starting to lose my voice. I will be. Oh, go ahead. Nick, do you want to say something? Uh, they say dragon tails guys oh sorry about that dragon tail do you want to say something no i just wanted to confirm what you just said about maga to me it reminds me of because maga i believe 
generally is it is a cult because if you it's almost like com- to draw a comparison if you say something right now against israel or question the government you're an anti-semite if you call into question anything with maga you're anti-american and it 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 definitely, and it falls under as well with this whole conservative mindset that are very quick to judge, um, you know, growing up in a very conservative Christian home, people completely look at the outward appearance. Um, they're not accepting of people if they're not, you know, reflecting what their heart is. There's a lot of things to unpack there. But I also think with what you just said, MAGA and most people in conservative circles don't think long term right now everything is election to election to election and at this point everything is if trump doesn't become president then the country is 100 percent gone and i i think i i don't think that's a true statement um i do believe the election is important i believe voting is important but at the same time there are so many other things that are bigger than us politically that things are not going to change under one person. And then what happens after those after those four years, if Trump were to even become president? Um, I just feel like it's kind of, th- th- there's this mentality that this is it. Um, I don't know if it's because there's a lot of boomers that are in there, and for many of them, this is it. Um, I, 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 I don't know. But it's definitely, the, the left has marched its way as we've studied through the, through the institutions with a very long-term goal over generations and decades of time. And I feel like the right, when they get one victory, which we've talked about, then they pat themselves on the back and say, yep, we've done it. But there's no, there's no real tactic or strategy and longevity and educating people, which is what you're doing. And just starting by learning the language and calling people out. And like Nick, I believe was saying, where you can scare the shit out of a communist. If you know exactly what it is they're saying based on their language and not try to debunk them. Um, Because when people like, I don't know, whoever's on Twitter, talks about people with purple hair and they're weird and they're mentally ill and they throw these terms around i'm always saying but they're kicking your ass these are the people that are winning and it's taken decades to reach this point where we have what you consider freakishly looking people that are coming out non-binary don't believe in gender and they are growing stronger in numbers and they belong to their own cult that's becoming the majority in our country and people refuse to see that. So, um, yeah, I guess that's basically what I want to say. I'm tired. It's 2 a.m. here in Hong Kong. Oh, so that's all, that's all I'll say. But I, I really appreciate you in these spaces because I think this, what you're doing right now and all of this in this space at this moment is what I think you've needed to do. And I think it's such a great way for people to actually be able to talk. We can hear you, Carlin, outside of your your teacher mode because you are a rational person and there is that there there are valuable things that you have to say and to teach you are unbelievably misunderstood because the online world is crazy so i I really appreciate you holding this space uh, this space allowing us to speak i'm afraid one day you're going to become so big that we won't be able to speak because you're going to be like this popular figure and you're not going to have time to do this kind of stuff. So I think it's just very valuable what, what you're doing right now. Hey, Dragon Tail, I really appreciate that. You're quite a trooper for being up so late. I know you're in uh, you're in Hong Kong, so you're on the other side of the world. So everyone, everyone, let's give a hand to Dragon Tail for hanging in with us, even though he definitely wants to go to bed. And um, you know, I appreciate that. Like I like I actually really like I kind of underestimated the value of Twitter Spaces when they first started, but I've been really participating in a lot of other people's Twitter Spaces, and I kind of realized that this is like a really valuable tool for us to be able to talk and communicate with each other and to really suss out these ideas on a much more organic level and now that i've kind of figured out that i can use them and also record podcasts for my i'm like i can do two things at once like this is great and um, i do think it's important to have these conversations because 
you know like like you said i mean i think like the internet like i don't want to i don't want to like come across as like a victim or anything like the internet is a cruel place the internet is is a place that like willfully distorts a lot of people and i think that you know the things that i've been put through on the internet in some respects it really has helped me to um find an audience that is actually smarter that can see through the bullshit and so in many ways um it is a blessing i consider it to be that like a lot of people have just filtered themselves out of my audience because quite frankly they wouldn't have been smart enough to keep up with my content like my content is difficult it's meaty it's it goes in depth and it's not it's not necessarily something that everyone can keep up with and so while it has created problems and it has created a lot of these misperceptions and i have james Lindsay ranting and raving about how i have a personality disorder that i don't have all over his timeline to half a million people which is just great it also it allows me to you know it, there's a certain amount of freedom in that because you know a lot of people think i'm crazy I don't think I'm crazy. I have video to back up every single thing that I say and people can access that if they want to. And if they don't want to, that's going to be an IQ test for them. Hey, we do have two new people who've uh, been added to the space and I do want to welcome Jay and I want to welcome Aiden. Before we go to you guys, I have just one thing I want to address over on my YouTube chat. We have someone in my YouTube chat called Ignis who is uh, complaining about the fact that I said conservatives judge people too much based on their looks where the left doesn't do that. They said, this is ridiculous. People judge judge by appearance by default you have to fight that instinct and look further you have people judging other people but for judging people congrats and it's like you know if you want to judge people by their appearance that's your business but what I will tell you is you are going to lose to the left if you do that. So what is more important to you to make fun of someone for having a haircut that you don't like or being overweight or is beating the left more important to you? You have to choose one. Like this is not like you like it like how important is it to you to win? Like I mean, I don't know how this is difficult, but this is this is honestly what it comes down to. What are you willing to sacrifice in order to beat the left at the end of the day? And if you are not willing to sacrifice calling everyone that you don't like a free or a weirdo or making fun of them for their looks you're gonna lose and i think dragon till you talked about that it's like you know like that is the typical thing that we hear from conservatives and people can come to my socialism stream so the conservatives come into my chat and say this all the time where they come in and they say these people are losers they're freaks they're ugly etc cetera, etc cetera. guys queer marxists are winning right now Queer Marxists are in every school in this country. Queer Marxists are convincing kids that they're non-binary. Queer, like there are, there are school districts in which 40% of kids identify as non-binary. So you might look at these people and you might think they're freaks and they're weird and they're all these things and you wouldn't want to date them or fuck them or any of these things. That's fine. But right now they're kicking your ass. And so can we have some perspective here? Because I don't want to win in a, and, and live in a world, uh, excuse me, I don't want to, them to win and have to live in a world run by queer Marxists just because people on the right couldn't hold back that desire to call everyone a freak that they disagree with. You're losing to them. What does it say about you and your effort and your strategy that you are losing to them provably right now. And not only is that going to impact your life, that is going to impact your children's life and your grandchildren's life because they are not going to live in the United States as you understand it right now because the left is going to win and it's going to change everything that made this country great. So I want to go over to Jay now. Jay, what do you think? Hey, um, yeah, wow, a lot. <laughs> I want to make it short. I want to be concise. I mean, even national socialism, that started on the left. Like, it's always it's the reactionary left that becomes the authoritarian right in most of these situations. It's, it's not like the middle of the moderates. And the, the idea of conservatism today, in my opinion, is a joke. Because it's, it's like a team sport. If you ask them, okay, what are you conserving? They won't have an answer for you. And the same thing if you ask a progressive, what are you progressing? They won't have an answer for you because they don't even understand the political philosophy they're ascribed to, um, or they're ascribing to, I should say. It's, it's annoying. Um, and the way Lindsay's spurging out on you, it, it just shows that he hasn't seen your work. I was just listening to another space before where they are talking about education and like, I was going to chime in, but I saw you doing space. I want to come over here because, like, I've learned so much about how, like, just these individual, uh, you know, school boards and in, in their localities operate versus, like, you know, the rhetoric just keeps getting, like, spun around. So when these people are talking, like, it helps because I can help these people because when they're talking about 
getting on their school board, you know, the, the typical stuff. They don't understand, like, how ingrained certain things are into the system and how you've said how they'd only, what do you say, only, only two schools, right, in the whole country have the school board has any control over curriculum in the first place. Yeah, in Ver Plus, Vermont, right. Vermont and Connecticut are the only two states in which the school board has control over the curriculum. Right, yeah. and like, so it just shows that he's not watching your work, which is lame because you've, you know, studied his work. So I, I don't know, I think he is, I hope he's being like leveraged. I just mean to say this, but I'd rather it be this than him just be like a sellout or any like you know a limited hangout. And I just I hope he was told to shut up or else. Like that's my 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 biggest hope for the Lindsay situation. But I think like people really do need to watch out for like there's no there's nowhere else to go besides like these radical fringes. Like there there is no one for like a large portion of I, I noticed especially listening to you know younger people talk there's like i call it like the nietzsche problem first time i read nietzsche it was like it fucked up my head a little bit and i was like we're gonna have to deal with this and it's i think that like whatever like the roughness of spirituality or god or meaning or purpose it is very apparent and there's nowhere to go so people are sliding into very authoritarian and nihilistic camps and I don't know what to do about it, but I'm I'm like I'm just glad that you you stay on your square no matter what. Like I, I always appreciate that, Carmen. Thank you. Th thank you, Jay. And I'll you know I'll say this in regards to like the James Lindsay stuff because that's uh, for people who may have joined after. That's kind of like the basis of this space is James Lindsay is uh, hurling all these uh, names at me. He's insulting me. He's calling saying I have borderline personality disorder. He's trying to struggle session. James Lindsay is actively trying to prevent people from seeing my work. Um, we have receipts of all of this. He struggle sessions places to remove links to my work that he doesn't like because I contradict him. Um, I have a now openly and you can read about this over on my sub stack. You can see all the receipts in which James Lindsay has hurled these baseless character attacks against me. He's also attacked members of my community. He's spread lies about me, all this stuff. I've got all this documented over on my Substack stack um, because I am openly now challenging James Lindsay to debate me, which is not something I've ever done. I don't actually engage in debate culture at all, but I'm just so sick of this shit that I am now saying, okay, James, we are going to engage in an intellectual back and forth. And if you don't like that, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do these Twitter spaces and I'm going to explain to people what the real left thinks. I'm going to lay it all out very, very clearly, and I'm going to give people the receipts for that on my Substack and my YouTube channel. And if you don't want to show up and debate me, then then people can at least learn what the left actually thinks, apart from the bullshit Gnostic sex cult that he's uh, that he's selling people based on being paid for by Moms for Liberty and Turning Point USA and stuff like that. And just so we're clear about this, for the record... James Lindsay blocked me on Twitter a long time ago because I was using his tweets to uh, teach people what the left actually believes. But I do not have James Lindsay blocked on Twitter. So all James Lindsay has to do is unblock me on Twitter and come into this Twitter space and actually have a conversation about this. And I will engage in an intellectual conversation based on ideas, but he will never do that because he cannot intellectually debate me. And so that is the point of all of this. The man has a huge platform. He is trusted by so many people to teach them about the left. And he is utterly failing in his one and only responsibility. And not only that, but he is smearing so many people right now. It's not just me, James. Lindsay's going after. He's going after Tucker Carlson. He's going after Dave Smith. He's going after um, Martyr Maid, um, you know, Daryl Cooper, because Tucker Carlson dared to interview him. He's obviously going after Nick Fuentes. He hates Nick Fuentes. He is going after Candace Owens. He's going after anyone that is not towing the line that James Lindsay wants them to tell. By the way, for those of you who read the Unhuman book by Jack Posobiec and Joshua Lissick, who I think Joshua Lissick is just fabulous. Everyone should follow Joshua Lissick. He is, he is amazing. He's actually the guy that wrote the book. Don't tell Jack Posobiec I said that, but Joshua Lissick actually wrote that book. And so if you enjoyed the Unhumans book, just know James Lindsay did exactly the same thing to Joshua Lissick and Jack Posobiec as he's done to me. And so they don't like him either. They like he he has smeared them. He tried to smear their work. James Lindsay literally does this to anyone who tries to present a rational perspective of the left. And so I've had enough. And so I'm openly challenging him to have an intellectual discussion of ideas. And if he doesn't want to do that, then I will demonstrate that he is not capable of doing that. Um, Jay, do you have anything else to say to that? No, just real quick. I, I don't want to be too much like online in the recorded space. I, do you talk to right side? 
uh, every every ever... once in a while i would like to do a space with right side i love right side right side is great she's awesome and she i don't know if you'd want to hit her up in her dms but she did some looking into his like holdings and stuff a while back for some interesting reasons you might have an interesting talk with her if you hit her up in the dms really that's interesting yeah. i will hit her up in the dms i think um right side by the way um goes by exclusionary um exclusionary is her handle with like two x's i highly recommend everyone follow right side right side is awesome i mean, I mean follow all the speakers on the stage of course but right side we'll get her in for a twitter space at some point and i i'm gonna i i, I owe her a dm we haven't chatted in a minute so i will definitely do that um, I want to welcome Aiden to the space. Aiden, you have your hand up. What do you want to say? Hey, sorry guys. <clears throat> I'm multitasking and I, and I jumped on a little late, but uh, a couple of the things I heard, uh, you know, the, the, with this blue hair, um, for one, I, I, I want to say, I disagree that they are the majority. I mean, you're, you're talking about a uh, democratic leaning, uh, population, which I was a part of. Right. So these blue hairs are kind of fringe and are kind of soldiers of the Democratic Party right now in terms of having some kind of uh, um, it's like, kind of like virtue signaling. But I want to say that teasing or making fun of people for their appearances is really just adding fuel to their fire, you know, to the, giving them ammunition, because I think it's I think it's cruel and, and immature to make fun of people like that uh, publicly. Now, of course, with you and your friends and, and internally, you can. You know, you say whatever you want, you tease people, but I think outwardly, you know, the, the whole, the whole, I think one of their, one of their fake virtues is that, you know, they, they want, they're trying to preach acceptance, even though they're preaching, you know, division and, um, and, and pushing a uh, racial divide amongst, amongst uh, the population. However, their shield of virtue, the fake virtue is that, you know, they want acceptance for everyone. Um, I think, uh, you know, I think that, I think that it's a social problem and an educational problem. The fact that we see a lot of these, and I don't want to, you know, again, we call them blue hairs, but it's really related more to education. I think it's a lack of education. I think a lot of these people, and again, it's not, it's not, I'm not making fun of them, but I think a lot of them are kind of more on the low IQ end um, and just look for purpose, look for community. And they find that community within kind of this radical uh, leftist agenda that's being that's which is artificial, which is uh, being injected into into the West right now to sow division and and God knows for what nefarious future purpose. So Aiden, I agree with you on a couple points, and I disagree with you on a couple points. Um, the point that I agree with you on is ed education is absolutely at the heart of all of this. And and my personal position is I think we need to abolish the K through 12 public schools. I think we need to uh, privatize all education. I think people should either be um, homeschooled or like basically no more property taxes going to pay for public education. Parents get that money to figure out an educational opportunity for their child, whether that be like a community pod or like a tutor or homeschooling or whatever it is. Um, um, there are a lot of communities, especially where I live in New Hampshire, where parents have successfully pooled their school choice money and they basically get together and they hire a tutor and they like rent out a schoolhouse for all their kids to go to. So they've completely privatized their curriculum using state taxpayer dollars because they're using school choice money to do it. But I think we need a radical like just abolition of public education. And by the way, I don't actually even think that abolishing the Department of Education is good enough. Like, honestly, it's a great first step. I don't think Trump is actually going to do it. I think he's lying about that. But I think it would be awesome if he actually did do it. So we are 100% on the same page that this comes from education. I do not believe personally that the schools are fixable at this point just because the problem has been festering for so long and it would take too much to overhaul them. It wouldn't be able to happen in any of our lifetimes. Um, that's for sure. Now, where I disagree with, and I also agree with you, by the way, I'm not calling people names. I think that, like you said, I think it's like if you're just roughhousing with your friends and you're making funny with your friends, and I think this is especially something that guys do. I, I'm like a tomboy. I hang, I hang out with guys and so um so i understand that guys make fun of each other and they call each other names and stuff like that and that's how they show their love in many respects and um so i get that and i think that that's an appropriate thing but when you're calling other people that that you don't have that affinity towards it does come across a little bit differently so i think we agree there um where i disagree with you is on a couple of points number one 
I am not talking about Democrats. This has nothing to do with the Democratic Party. The the people that we're talking about with the radical revolutionary left, they hate the Democratic Party. Um, I think you joined a little bit later. We kind of covered that earlier. So that's not your fault. That's just a matter of like timing. Um, but they hate the Democratic Party. They do not feel represented by them. They denounce them all the time. So this is not about, uh, you know, being part of the Democratic Party. Um, uh, they're way further left than that. I also wouldn't say I think they're the majority, but I think there are more than enough of them that um, they they can currently at their numbers elicit a cultural revolution in this country they 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 have the numbers to do it they are highly organized and and it's not even that they're the majority it's that they're organized and that they exist all over the country and they are constantly pushing forward like the right doesn't constantly push forward the left is constantly in this battle of inches every single day taking every advantage that they can they are mission driven they are focused they are determined they know what their goal is and they're constantly pushing forward i do disagree with you that they're low IQ. I don't believe they're low IQ. A lot of leftists are extremely well read. They're able to articulate ideas. Um, they they um, they understand what they're talking about. They understand the historical development of it. They're able to teach all that. The thing of it is, is that they are entirely insulated in a leftist ecosystem. So they don't have anyone questioning them or challenging them on their ideas. And if people come in and try to question them, they get expelled from the ecosystem. So I understand why you might think they're low IQ, but their high IQ around their specific ideas and their ideology. Um, they're not stupid people by any means. I mean, you're always going to have stupid people in every bunch. I mean, you could point to stupid people on all ends of the political spectrum. But for the most part, I've, I've found leftists to be extremely well read and extremely well versed in their ideas. Um, do you have anything to reply to with that? Yeah, I want to say that the, the people that are leading this uh, you know, this anti-national movement are for sure, you have to be incredibly intelligent. I mean, you, you could just see that from the results. You could see that from the, from the, from the divide that split this country and from, uh, and from the progress they've made in our political arena, for sure. Uh, I, you know, when I was saying low IQ, I was kind of referring more to the minions, the people that go out there, uh, you know, just chanting whatever they hear uh, with their, you know, with their, within their, in their, you know, with their picket lines. Uh, so that's why I was referring to, because, you know, th those are the first people that are going to follow. So I was really talking more about the, the, the masses and the, and the minions and the people that listen to their, yeah. uh, to, to, you know, to their, uh, whatever their motives are. Uh, now, go, you know, going back to education, you know, I a hundred percent agree with you. Uh, I think private education, you, know, you know, private schools uh, should be more prominent, but I do think also it's a very, very complicated uh, area you know, when you look at when you look at a lot of the extremist um, uh, factions and nations, and when you look at you know w one thing that you're going to find predominantly in a lot of these people uh, in a lot of these countries uh, is national pride uh, is is kind of uh, a unified doctrine. You know, so you know I remember when I was a kid, I remember singing the P Pledge of Allegiance. So I think there are some basic things I don't mind personally, and maybe some people might agree with me and might disagree, but I would love to instill national pride in our children, you know, not to, not to the degree where they become, you know, uh, fanatical, but like we have an incredibly, we have an incredible country. I've traveled not super extensively, but I've, I've actually lived around the world. I've lived in South America. I've been to the Middle East. I've been to a lot of places and goddamn, let me tell you, there's no place like the United States and it's, and it's precious and we don't want to lose it. There's nothing wrong in my opinion with teaching, with teaching our, our, our youth that we should be proud of this and help to nurture and protect and grow what we have here, right? One. Two, I don't mind teaching p uh, kids. And by the way, just so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not religious. Um, I don't even, I don't want to really label myself, but I might be more on the lines of an atheist agnostic, agnostic. But I also, but seeing what Christian virtue has provided for the West and it's part of its identity, I see value in it. What's wrong with teaching, you know, kids doesn't necessarily have to be under the guise of Christianity if you don't agree with it, but at least a lot of the virtues that come from Judeo-Christian um, doctrine, you know, for example, how to treat your 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 neighbors and and not to steal and stuff like that. Um, I think that I think education as a whole, we're 100 percent lacking, even, you know, from the sciences perspective, from moral perspective, from every kind of perspective, having private schools will allow parents to choose where they can educate their kids so their kids don't have to be indoctrinated into this kind of perverted, uh, ultra-left, uh, woke ideology thing, which I think, by the way, is savage and criminal. 
I mean, it's dizzying to even see what, what kids are being exposed to uh, in schools right now. So from an educational perspective, I think we should, again, my personal opinion, somehow instill some kind of national pride, uh, you know, uh, uphold the Constitution and some kind of uh, uh, virtue system in terms of maybe, you know, the basics of uh, Judeo-Christian virtues at the very least or whatever we as a nation feel, um, um, you know, would help our youth uh, navigate, you know, their adulthood. Yeah, so I have a couple of things to respond to that. So, uh, so in regards to the the people who are chanting, who you said they were just kind of like low IQ people who are going along with the masses, I want to make sure people understand. Like the purpose of the chanting is to solidify them together as a collective. It's to show you're a member of the group. And so when you see the campus protests and you see these students uh, chanting, like standing around chanting, like "Free, Free Palestine," like I've, I've listened to so many of these chants, I can't even tell you because I, I just sit there and I watch their protests to see what they do and to see what they talk about um what those kids are doing though when they're not chanting is they're sitting around reading philosophy they're having discussion groups they're hosting like their professors are hosting these impromptu classes where they're breaking down these ideas so again just because you see them chanting and engaging in these protests and it looks like they're a bunch of mindless drones i don't want people to mistake that because they're doing that because that's part of that's kind of like their church right i don't want to say that um, it is not true that communists want to ban all religion. They just don't want religion to usurp the communist ideology. So you can practice religion as long as it doesn't usurp communism, essentially. Um, but it is like it, it is like a, it is almost a ritual experience for them to engage in these kind of group protests, these group chants. And it's how they um, it's how they signal that they are a good comrade and a good member of the collective. So just a quick note on that. Um, I, I like I think you said a lot of good things about education. And I, I, I agree with you to a certain extent that um, like I would, I, you know, I it, like I would actually like to st like bring back if, if we have to have public schools, can we start teaching why communism is bad again? There there was actually a time in this country where it was taught in schools. They have textbooks about this, why communism is bad and will not work. And um, that got eliminated at some point, which I think we should uh, bring that back for sure. But I also like I'm not a Christian either. I'm a general generalized spiritualist. I'm a highly spiritual person, but I do not adhere to any religion. Um, but I actually tend to agree with you on the idea of Christian values. I wouldn't go so far as to say Judeo-Christian values, but I would say I would say Christian values um, in terms of like, I actually wouldn't mind if that was kind of like more infused. Now, I don't want anyone to be forced to do anything against their will. I don't want anyone to be forced to be a Christian. You know, people sometimes make fun of me for being friends with Nick Fuentes because they say, Carlin, don't you know Nick Fuentes wants to burn you at the stake because of your spiritual beliefs? And I'm like, well, I don't think he's actually going to do that. So let's all just uh, settle down for a moment i don't think that's actually going to happen um but like i do think there is something to the idea of you know like just like you know put like like basic things like treating people correctly and acting like a good neighbor and and things like that and i do think that um you know like a general kind of like adherence to some sort of moral code like people think i don't have a moral code because i'm not a christian i do it's just based on different things and a lot of the things i believe do tend to like i think a lot of these different belief systems they do tend to overlap on basic questions of morality and I think that um you know it's one of those things where and I've thought about this a lot over the past several months it's like can can people exist in a society in which there is no agreement on upholding some basic set of moral standards I'm not saying that everyone should be a Christian by any means but I do think it's like thou shall not kill thou shall not steal like there, there are some basic things right now they're just kind of being thrown out the window in our society kind of probably partially because of like unfettered immigration and we have all these people coming in and living in our country that are not americans that don't want to assimilate to american values or things like that like they're they're literally eating dogs and cats which is just crazy um and and stuff like that and so i i kind of like do agree with you um in that in that respect uh, I, you know, I was gonna, I was gonna add some more, but I, I know Jay uh, had his hand up, and I think he wanted to have some kind of response, maybe to what I said earlier. So, if you would, you be okay if he? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Jay, do you have anything to say to that? Well, yeah, I mean, well, you know me, I agree on education all the way, like first and foremost, like real education, not public schooling of any kind. But like, you know, the the pledge of allegiance, we didn't do that 
for a long time. Do you know where it came from? Where did it come from? It came from Prussia. Like oh, when we I did know that, actually, I think. Yeah, so they used to, except their salute looked more like the Nazi salute. It just did that, but after the 30s, we, we, we changed it. Um, it. That was when we switched over to, like, the factory model schooling was set up by, like, Rockefeller and Carnegie and all these guys. So, like, I'm for, like, not, like, I want to say national pride. I'm for it if it's for something. Like, not, ju- like, like I have, pro- like, I'll always protect my home, you know? Like, but right now, I think our biggest issue is what does our nation stand for? Like, the, the most amazing thing, I think, about America, the American experiment, beyond the propaganda, because they almost sold the propaganda so well that it did create a, a zeitgeist that made it hard for them to control because it was basically America was like a try they were shifting from I guess I would call it like tyranny by you know army to tyranny through commerce it would be the best way to put it um but uh, unless like we have but but the cool thing about America is it is it was a place where Throughout history, you can't find a civilization that in such a short amount of time expanded and integrated such a, a varied group of people, not not Greece, not Rome, not none of them were able to, to do it like America did it. Um, and now we, we have to like find that again. We have to have something to be integrated into, to have a national pride in, not just to say like, well, it's America. I mean, of course you're going to defend your home, but there, there's no... Um, like spark in it anymore like all the all this stuff like uh that we're dealing with now is like you know these lefties he's like and beyond they understand like you know this esoteric shit not in like the mystical way but like what carlin was just saying like the the gathering and joining of energy and chanting in one direction believe it or not that that's real magic it's not you know fancy movie magic it's what that's what magic is it's like focused attention together in unison and they know how to do that and they're not and you got to realize your enemies are revolutionaries they're not looking to take over the system and run it properly they're looking to turn it into ash and because of their the philosophy that they don't even understand they think it will their, their utopia will magically rise and it's the same thing as far as i'm concerned if you're on the right and think you're gonna you know bunker down in your uh little place in the mountains and wait for the world to uh, to end so you can come up and what raise your utopia from the ashes like that's how it, it, it spreads to both sides this this wokeness so like but i do agree again with, with the education because that's where it was originally corrupted because in the you know mid 1800s you know we had this country had a strong sense of faith independence and ingenuity and that was purposely stamped out and it goes beyond just the Jews or just the whatever Jesuits or the it's it's a very it's you know they don't even have a name, but a lot of them are Jews, a lot of them, a lot of them are Jesuits, a lot of them, but none of them believe in God, not your God, not my God. They you know believe in power, and they believe in making heaven on earth because they don't believe in the eternal. Like that's what they are. They're accelerationists. It's called immunizing the eschaton. That's what they see it as. Uh, so yeah, like it, it, this stuff runs deep, it's, and and that's why, like, when it comes to bring it back to Lindsay, that it's not hard to find. So like, knowing if anyone has seen James Lindsay's stuff and see how thorough he is, that he could miss all of this. I don't, I don't buy it. Well, this is why I say that James Lindsay's lying to people, and and you know, people say all the time, like, Carlin, are you sure he's lying, or does he just not know? And I'm like. I've spent three and a half years listening to as much leftist training as I can possibly listen to. I do it literally six days a week. I create at least two dozen hours of content every single week watching this stuff. I don't know how James Lindsay can do the amount of research that he's done and not run into these ideas. It it is just not possible. It it is everywhere across their, their documents. And so 
When I say he's lying, I firmly believe that he has absolutely come across these ideas a million times across all the work he's done, and he has chosen to ignore them, and he's chosen not to inform his audience about them. And, and then another point, too, that you made, Jay, that I think is actually really important is, like, that whole idea of, like, the chanting being that is, like, that is focused energy and attention. Like, there is power in that if the entire group is saying the same thing. And we've all seen this. Like, if you've ever been to church and you're all singing the same song, song in church and you're all like you could feel the energy from that song and everything especially if it's a happy song not if it's one of those like kind of like downer church songs where no one really wants to be there but if like you're in one of those churches where people are dancing and they're having a good time or or if you're even like take it out of church for a second if you're at a rock concert and everyone's singing along with the band like you can feel the power in that in that room you can feel the power of that moment and it's the same thing with the chanting and um, you're absolutely correct. Like that is how you, th that is literal magic. That is focusing energy and attention on a goal that you want as a collective group. And that's kind of, that's a force that is really difficult to reckon with when you're just trying, like you can, you can't combat that with facts and logic. That is an emotional, visceral experience. And that is what we are sorely lacking in terms of uh, trying to overcome any of this. You know, I think, uh, sorry, you might, uh, you had touched on something earlier, uh, you know, and, and Jay had mentioned in, in this chanting thing. I think, I think, uh, he was saying, you know, what, what, you know, when you're teach, if we are going to teach some kind of national pride, you know, what are we, like, what are our, our, our goals now? What, you know, what, what, what are we trying to lead ourselves, in, you know, into the future? What, what are, what are our ideals? And I think that's an important question, you know, because I remember vaguely when I was growing up, you know, we had the Cold War and that was, you know, which, by the way, when you talk about teaching uh, at communism and 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 its downfalls in school, which is important. I mean, I grew up remembering this stuff, you know, and we were incredibly anti-communist. I mean, we were we were, you know, the, the Cold War was decades fighting the USSR and and the spread of their influence. Um, but I, you know, when when you talk about what's our purpose moving into the future, you know, to teach our new generations, what do they have to look forward to? Why should they be? you know, proud of our, of, of, of the United States, for example. Well, one, I think just from a fundamental perspective, we can, we can just compare ourselves not in a bad way, but to the rest of the world to see, you know, the, the, the how we have evolved and how we compare to everyone else. One, two, I think this is a more of a matter of opinion, right? Uh, but, you know, for myself, for example, you know, we do have, uh, we do have an enemy. We have this kind of woke or globalist, uh, community that's trying to bring down the West. You know, I think that that's kind of the, the new USSR, in my opinion, that we have to tackle. I think that we have a lot of, you know, we have people like Elon Musk trying to push us into, into you know, maybe a, a interplanetary future moving into other places. I think that's another thing that we can be proud of and, and maybe invigorate our youth to something to believe in. Um, but I think, again, I think that's really more of a, and I would encourage a lot of people here to 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 add their voices and their opinions because I'd be curious as well as to what we can we can uh, use to to invigorate our youth and to and, and to continue the growth of our nation and to keep the you know what we've built alive. Thanks, Aiden. I really appreciate that. Um, we have a couple new additions to the stage, and I want to thank everyone for having um, such a great conversation with me today. I'm really enjoying this and appreciating it. Um, I want to go to a peasant named Damien. You've got your hand up. What do you have to say? Oh, well, uh, hey, hello, everybody. Uh, I got to say always a lot uh, because I'm always a road truck driver, so I spend a lot of time by myself <laughs> talking to my dog. What kind of so... dog? Wait, wait, wait. We have, to, we have to ask the important question. What kind of dog is it? <laughs> <laughs> Not a real truck driver. Uh, dog is a toy poodle. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I love it. I love it. Carry on. <laughs> so, uh, I'm just, you know, I'm I'm a contrarian by nature. So I just cannot help it, but it's not a provocateur type of mentality. It's always to get to the to the difficult truth. Um, so I'm gonna bring a little bit of pessimistic, but it's just for uh, thinking purposes. Uh, and from an outside perspective, because I'm born and raised in Puerto Rico and I came here trucking and start running the whole country, literally 48 states in Canada by myself. So, you know, people forget how, how, uh, and I forget, right. It is a, is a rude awakening. How, 
the, the type of relationship we as humans have with culture and subculture. It's literally like a sadomasochist type of thing, right? Uh, there's good and there's bad, and you just cannot leave it. So this, and, and to put a, to make it a little bit more precise, I'm talking about this country. I'm going to just talk about white people, right? So not to make it that complicated. This country is very complicated just for the white people by itself, right? I travel and literally it's like probably five cultures in this country that you can really uh, feel when you talk to people in general, not individual, in general. You, you got the, the, the North, um, New England, then you got the people from below that, then you got the Southeast. Uh, Florida is another thing, especially in the South. Um, you got the, the Bible Belt, then you got the, um, the people in the, um, how you call it, in the Midwest, and then California is another thing, and, and you got the, the, the Northwest. And the culture, they're so different. They, they dealing with people is so different, like in the South. People are a little bit more, the racism that I face was more than the South, but if they like you, they get very close to you. They, they're very touchy, something that, you know, it happens a lot in Puerto Rico, uh, but they're more aware, right? And all that for the, for the Bible Belt. Then you got the Midwest. There's a combination like in the Northwest and the Pacific Northwest, but with the religious undertone, right? They, they are... They are more open to talk to you. They got better, um, like, uh, I don't know the, the word is escaping me, but uh, better uh, models, I think, for talking. You know, they're, they're not that, uh, you, you got to keep a distance, but close. And then the Northwest, they're very open-minded, but still, they got a little bit of that nor the Midwest that you cannot get as close and making jokes so personal, like in the Southeast, like like the redneck culture, right? And California, yeah, that, that, every, you know, that's another thing. So to put that in perspective, to 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 tie it up a little bit, I think if 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 the and what okay, let me let me go back. Um, for the, the subject that you're bringing about James uh, Lindsay, yeah, you're right. But by heart, I'm a liberal because I'm, I'm so inclined about ideas and people and psychology and, and all that stuff. So just because of that, I'm going to lean more to the left. But I'm a working class. I'm a liberal, right? So right there, even in, in the democratic sense that I've been, I, I feel very disconnected. Because it's the problem that, uh, and, and, and then I'll bring it to the example of what's happening in the right. It's the, it's the problem that happened in the left with the working class. Um, this guy that I follow a lot, uh, Charles Murray, talks about it, right? The intelligence and the intellectual to control of everything. And they're trying to dictate how people should think from just, you know, and they completely forgot. So I feel very disconnected in the left because I'm not an intellectual. So I'm a truck driver. Now, when I go to the right, right, I'm not religious, I'm a agnostic. When I go to the right, to the Southern, then I feel very connected because most of the people there are, are the labor class, right? But then I feel disconnected because I don't go to religions. And, 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 and it's the same thing, the left, since they don't go to, to the religion, they unite by ideology, right? And yes, it's true what you say, they're more fun. The artists, most of the artists are in the left. Uh, I don't know, no, no artist that ever wore a shirt, uh, a shirt of John Locke and Adam Smith is always, uh, you know, uh, uh, Fidel and, and the other guy. So yeah, it's more fun. But if you challenge their, in, their intellect, they do the same as the right but uh, in a more ego way, and the right goes more to body shaming or whatever looks, but it, it's exactly the same. So the problem is that at a human level, the religious aspect is stronger because not, no, no, no institution can unite strangers better than the churches. No, none, none. There, there's nothing better than the churches, even though they don't get along together, but what in the left side, uh, there's something about celebrating life just for the tragedy, the pain. There's nothing. 
there, there, there's nothing. There's no songs. There's no, nothing about celebrating life. No matter we kill, then in the community we don't we don't grieve with each other. So, I think the best strategy is what Brett Weinstein, his brother, is trying to do. We got to go back to the fundamentals of this country, to to before Abraham, Abraham Lincoln, and Abraham Lincoln for me it was the person that messed up this country because it was supposed to be a state thing because people are so different and we are product of our culture and our subcultures. So they had a very great vision. You, you know, they were influenced by, by John Locke, by Adam Smith, the Invisible Hand. So they knew what individuality was at the core. And and I think that's the the the, the key idea to to get educated why the founding father were so important. They were trying to do, and this type of separation, living by a state, is good for all of us because then, is people group together how they want to, feel American in their way, and and fix problems at a local level, and 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 you force discernment because discernment is not a, a an innate quality of human being. We are tribal by nature. And, and and yeah, I don't I don't know if it's it's obvious that the that we're tribal. So the the gridlock especially was created to force a, a, a culture of dissent, and they failed because Abraham Lincoln, you know, with the slavery excuse, slavery. You know, I'm not saying that to keep slavery, but he went too far in uniting the whole the whole country by force, and it was completely opposite of the thesis of, of the founding fathers. So that's that's my insight. This country is very complicated. And and then you if you put the black American experience and all that stuff. So, you know, it, even with white people, let's say the white people, the the, the, the the city people, like you know, they make fun of the hillbillies. And then the hillbillies and the rednecks, they say, no, I'm not a hillbilly. So all those subcultures, you ain't going to change that with, with, with no constitution. So and no ideal ain't gonna change that that never. So yeah, I I, I guess that my my uh, how you say it my apportation to 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 the thing. But yeah, I can see what what, what you were saying about Jim C uh, James Lindsay that he's missing is true. Um, but I feel it too as a laborer in the in my in, in my in the left. Mm-hmm. I, I cannot relate to the to the to the people uh, that work in a very abstract field, I, I just can't. There's like a subtle, there's always, and it's subconsciously, that's why I'm not bitter, that's why I don't fight, uh, because I read. But in a subconscious level, there's like a, a, a type of uh, content and, 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 and there's a type of um, patronizing, and that's why they live, just keep on bombarding the country with uh, welfare. That that's the reason why it's just welfare, just welfare because they're too they're, they're not too smart and it's like uh, you know uh, who who the hell wants that and welfare I lived in welfare and got raised uh, close to the projects my friends were the pro- projects and people they never discuss the 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 horrible effects of too much welfare it just create another subculture of 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 conformity that we already have it just it just deepen it. And and yeah, it takes it, it, yeah. It, it, that's another subject, but yeah, I agree with you in that and that thing that the right. Uh, what is the solution? Uh, stay away and trying to change the right and 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 talk about more what 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 is the American experiment. Yep. All right. Damien, I really appreciate uh, your your perspective. And, you know, one of the things I didn't touch on today is immigration at all. And immigration is absolutely so going back to like the topic of this space for a second, this space started as a topic of, um, you know, explaining what the core goal of the left is and how it's all about abolishing capitalism, which the left defines as private property ownership. This is really important for people to uh, understand if they want to understand everything the left does. And one of the topics that we didn't talk about is um, is immigration and the borders which is it kind of directly relates to some of the things you were talking about there and it's a important thing for people to understand so 
the left believes, and this is why we're seeing open immigration basically in the country right now, the left believes that borders are enforcement mechanisms for private property. I mean, that's literally what borders are, right? And so what they want is to not only uh, have completely open immigration, they don't want any borders to exist at all in the country. So if the left wins, not only is there going to be pretty much completely open immigration with every country, there also aren't going to be any more states. The United yeah, States no, no, of America I, will I see, see. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I agree 100 percent with you. And the part that that's the other part that I hate. I, I usually voted most of my time Democratic. The the part that I they don't get. And I used to live in in Edinburgh, my, Texas, right there, McAllen. I used to go to Mexico all the time. Is that uh, you see that the the part that is very tricky, like for the white collar job. There's arbitrary regulations to not let everybody get into their domain and lower the wages artificially. You, it's a system of uh, the academic accreditation system, right? It, it, it doesn't make sense. That means that even people from Cuba, very high educated, the system here, even they got a mastery, a uh, master's or whatever, they know because you, you don't, you don't qualify because of that credit. They, uh, accreditation system they got to go and work as a laborer as a laborer then they'll take away right most people when they see their resume oh you can you 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 are more educated in this aspect in this aspect because you went to university in your country yeah of course i want you because you got some skills better for but for better communication probably and and you know uh, and, and most other stuff than somebody that doesn't have a diploma so we get we get the labor, the lower class gets hammered twice by 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 the you know by the amount, increasingly amount of of illegal and legal immigration. That it's like there's no there's no uh, no accounting going on, and plus the legals that are not permitted to work in the white collar job because of accreditation problems, they are gonna be preferred to the workforce and the labor class also. So yeah, I 100 percent agree with you there too. All right. Thank you, Damien. I do want to move on. We've got some new speakers on the stage. Um, I'm not going to be able to stick around too much longer, guys, but I do want to make sure that we give everyone a chance to speak that uh, wants to speak. And uh, Mac B, I see your hand is up. What do you have to say about all this? No, you're absolutely right. And I think Aiden made a point earlier and stuff that you guys obviously grew up in a different generation than I did because I was 97. But what happened was, and I kind of notice this is that the older generations once the soviet union fell apart they had this very naive hubris about them that like you know we defeated the soviets you know communism's no longer going to exist you know america's still america but but people forget that the communists sat there and said we can take america without firing a shot and you know, they've done the long march through the institutions, you know, do the work. And, you know, they're now in places of institutional power, which for some people, institutional power is more powerful than political power. Yep. The communists, they don't want, they don't let their members sign up to be, you know, politicians because in their view, political power is basically worthless. If you have institutional power like corporations, the universities, you know, um, uh, what, like NGOs, things like that. Oh, you've got, you know, you've got all the power you need. Yeah, I think all those places without term limits. <laughs> it, it, well, exactly, Jane. I think this is, um, I'm really glad you brought that up on, on Mac B. And I do actually have several articles about this over on the Substack, which is again, Carlin, K A R L Y N dot Substack dot com. If you guys are not signed up yet for my Substack, you can sign up for free email updates anytime I post new content. I do written breakdowns of the left. It's also where you'll find my podcast hosted and, and stuff like that. But the difference between institutional power and political power is something a lot of people don't understand. A lot of the far left radical groups, they do not believe that they're going to achieve their cultural revolution in the United States through political power. That's not to say if they if they can if they can get someone elected to a position, they'll do it. They'll kind of play around with it. This is how we got um, the squad in Congress. Um, it's how you'll get a lot of lo like, especially in blue cities like Philadelphia and uh, Chicago. There are a lot of socialists that are actually elected to positions there. But 
for the most part, they believe that they have to integrate through the institutions to get into these positions that are impossible to be fired from. And eventually they are going to try to violently overthrow the, the, the federal government. I do, and we had them on tape talking about this, so it's not like a secret or anything. But um, it, it is the institutional power that people really need to be worried about. Why that's really scary right now is we've got an election coming up. And a lot of people think that if Donald Trump just gets elected, he's going to save us all from everything. And I really hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that is not going to happen, guys. It's just not going to happen. Number one, because Donald Trump doesn't actually understand what the far left is in this country. He really does think Kamala Harris is a communist, and that is a problem. Um, so he's not going to be able to save us just purely from a lack of knowledge. But secondly, it honestly doesn't matter if the Republicans sweep the presidency, the House of Representatives, and the Senate in November, which I don't think they will. But even if they do, the left still controls all the institutions. And it doesn't matter who's in the political positions, because as long as the left controls the institutions, they are going to be in the power position. And they just keep moving forward no matter what. The left made more gains under Donald Trump's presidency than they did under Barack Obama's. That's just a fact, guys. They made more gains under Donald Trump's presidency than they did under Barack Obama's. And so that's because they understand taking over the institutions, getting in those positions that they can't be fired from. And then when they need to utilize those positions to make advances, they uh, they go ahead and they and they do that explicitly. So I'm really glad that you brought up uh, that difference, Mac B. I appreciate that. Um, let's see. I want to go to uh, Scurvy Rum. Scurvy Rum, you're on the stage. What do you have to say? Uh, hey there, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, you're good. All righty. So uh, going on the topic of immigration, I've actually I've actually posted some stuff on my on my Twitter account and brought up some stuff here and there on my YouTube channel about this topic. It seems like it it's not immigration that's going on, because if it was immigration, we wouldn't be seeing like 20,000 Haitians just suddenly move into a community like well, maybe not exactly overnight, but what was it, like a period of five years yeah. in uh, that place in Ohio? Yeah. yeah. But this seems, this does not seem like controlled immigration. This is full on invasion. And for me personally, um, I'm, a, I'm actually planning on uh, moving to Turkey in the near future. And, and I do understand, you know, cult, there is absolutely cultural differences. Uh, a few other things too, but I also recognize that even if I were to like marry into like a, a Turkish family, it's like I would forever be a guest in that country. Like that's not a common, that's not all that like uh, a common attitude here in the states because you know like melting pot or whatnot. But it's like I I understand that it's like okay, I know I should not try to piss off the locals. I. I understand that, you know, in, in that place, you know, time flows a, a little bit slower. So I don't need to always worry about getting things done on time exactly and uh, having that, um, like, American hustle around me. But I don't think the these uh, invaders, I'm just going to call them invaders because that, that's kind of what it is. <laughs> Um, they they are not they are not getting that memo. They are not going to assimilate anytime soon. So, such a dirty word among leftists is assimilate. When that's what it, you know, that's what a lot of legal immigrants try to do. They try their best to fit in with the the culture that's around them, and they're they're not getting they're not going to get shit for it. They're, like I actually do know uh, people who have immigrated here legally and it's like they're, they're doing they're actually doing fine and i get along with them but uh, as soon as like i i might see like uh, an illegal and there are and i have a feeling there's definitely some illegals in my area as we speak it's like i i can kind of tell that it's like okay you're you're just trying to mooch off uh you're just trying to mooch off a collapsing empire basically Hopefully I made sense. Kind of my first time being on one of these Twitter spaces. Hey, I think we I made my account. I made my account like a few days ago. 
<laughs> hey, I think for your first time, I think you did a really great job. I mean, I'll say this about uh, immigration. Um, you know, I'm married to an immigrant. My husband is from Ukraine. He speaks with like a very hmm. thick Russian accent. And what I will say is like my husband would love nothing more than to get rid of his Russian accent entirely because he wants to assimilate to the United States. Like he loves the United States. He sees himself as more of an American than he does a Ukrainian. I don't personally want him to get rid of his Russian accent because I love his Russian accent and I find it very sexy and I don't want it to go anywhere. But uh, but but like like but I I do agree with you. Like so, my husband and I when we first got together, we had to go to um immigration court quite a few times um to go through the process of like you know like you know when we got married, getting him like a permanent residence alien card and like all that stuff. And um and so when we went to immigration court, and this was um we got married 13 years ago, so it was around that time. It was within the couple first year, couple years of our marriage. Um, like you go to immigration court and like, I mean, I don't like, well, I'll, I'm just going to say it. There were a lot of Mexicans in immigration court that had been in this country for a really long time and none of them spoke English. And that always like, even, and this was back when I was on the left, I was a Democrat when this happened. That always kind of like rubbed me the wrong way. I'm like, you know, I don't mind, of course, if people like, you know, like, may, like you know, if, if they want to speak their, like Spanish at home or like, you know, maintain aspects of their culture and they're hurt. Like, I don't, I don't mind that. But like at the end of the day, if you're trying to like, is like immigrate to the United States you should be making an effort to assimilate to the culture mm -hmm. and I just don't see a lot of that happening not with every immigrant because there are immigrants here that love the United States and just want nothing more than to be a part of the United States and I think that you know when those people are, are assimilating um, I think that's what we want I mean I don't think that that's necessarily a yeah. bad thing we just have a huge number of people that are coming into the country right now that have no desire to assimilate to the United States and just to frankly want to take advantage of it Oh, uh, Carlin, uh, by, expect me to uh, learn some Turkish. That, that's going to be something for sure. Because I like not only I want to basically show that I'm not Johnny Somali. I don't want to cause trouble. I, I actually want to uh, like kind of st kind of stay and stay there for the rest of my days. Basically, find a find a nice Turkish woman, settle down, have a family, big family. Yeah. But I, I gotta. I'm trying to put in the work for that too. It's not going to be easy, but hey, nothing, nothing good in life comes easy. Hey, well, I appreciate your uh, contribution here today, Scurvy Rum. Thank you. Um, the, Alrighty. The last person on the stage that hasn't had a chance to speak yet is going to be NTG. So we're going to go to NTG and see what they have to say about this. Yo. There you are. Ah, okay, now it works. Um, yeah, I wanted to uh, put something about the liberals in the system, um, Peasant have said. Um, I, I think even if you can flush out them on all the institutions, the problem will not go away. Because this is an outcome of being for that long that wealthy, that many people who have who now hold these beliefs, have developed their beliefs because of their lifestyle they're living for the last 20, 40, 50, 60 years for probably two to three generations. They have living the liberal lifestyle and are to the core, um, meaning that what they believe is the right thing. And if you flush them out, out of the offices of the bureaucracy, you will not get rid of them. And they will turn in the private institutions, in the NGOs, in, in any meaningful uh, way into society. They are part of the U.S. society. And this is the crux of the whole thing. You cannot find them because to fight them, you need it to tear apart your world society and this is not going to work. One thing that uh, this is only what I want to add to this. Yeah, thank you for that, NTG. I, actually, I absolutely agree with what you're saying, actually. I, I think that um, it, excuse me, hang on. <clears throat> it's an extremely, hang on. <clears throat> Apologies. It is an extremely difficult uh, scenario to figure out how do we weed all this out of the institutions because this is kind of like, you know, I mean, like the cliche way, the, the cliche analogy to make is, you know, if you gain 100 pounds, you're not going to be able to lose that 100 pounds overnight. You're not going to be able to go on some magic diet pill or even like Ozempic or, you know, I mean, I guess if you get weight loss surgery, that can like, if they actually like liposuck that stuff out of you, you can lose it overnight. But there's no quick way to 
fix that problem, right? You just got to show up every day and you got to eat right and you got to go to the gym and you got to do all that stuff. And over the course of time, you'll lose that weight. And it's kind of the same thing with the takeover of the institutions. And again, I would include the public schools in this. It's like this has literally been a problem that has been festering for over a hundred years in the United States. Like the Frankfurt School came, well, the Frankfurt School came to the United States in the 30s. They set up shop at Columbia University in the 30s. And I'll say like there was a little bit of this there before that. The Frankfurt School is when it really started in earnest. So we're talking about like a, almost a hundred straight years of the Frankfurt School doing their long march through the institutions, taking over everything. You can't just fix all of that overnight. You can't just snap a finger and make that go away. And I think that unraveling the institutional problem is, is is something that I don't really think any of us have an idea of how to handle that. Again, for my money, I think it starts with just abolishing the public schools. I think it starts, quite frankly, with abolishing as much of the government as we can absolutely abolish and still just function on a minimal level. I mean, you look at like when Elon Musk came into Twitter, he fired like 75 percent of the company. And there was like a few moments in which it was touch and go with maybe a few things. But Twitter stayed up and running and it got better and better and better. And he just keeps making improvements because he got rid of all the dead weight that was holding everything back. And that may have been a painful thing to go through and it may have been been really difficult for them at the beginning. I remember hearing stories coming out of Twitter HQ of like people sleeping there and never leaving because they were all working so hard and all this. And and I'm sure that really sucked. But after that transition, it was absolutely the right thing to do to kind of get rid of a lot of the dead weight. And I think we need to do the same thing with the federal government. This is kind of honestly why like in my heart of hearts, I'm a libertarian. I know it's kind of a bad word, but like I, I, I'm, a, I'm an anarcho-capitalist in my heart of hearts. Like I think that, you know, the more of the government we can eliminate, the, the better the the country is going to be. And I think that's really one of the only ways to um, even begin to solve this problem is to take back the institutions and just say, nope, we're just not doing this anymore. Just go away. Just like we kind of like, um, you know, what what Malay is doing in Argentina to a certain extent. He's not a perfect person by any means, but I do like his model of just cutting it out entirely. Yeah, the problem here is the left will fight back and then we reach levels of communism against Nazi socialism. Yeah, this is exactly where you stand at right now. And you have to be very careful that this doesn't flip over in a civil war. Because if it flips over in a civil war, you're done for. Yeah. This is my saying as a non-US citizen, you are born by a civil war against the uh, British. You are shaped by a civil war. And if you have a third civil war, this will be your end. So be fucking careful, use violence against political opponents. Oh, hey, I completely agree with you on that. I, I am 100% in agreement. And I do think that the left is going to try to violently overthrow the government at some point. I think it's going to come in about 10 to 15 years. Um, I've laid out a timeline for that. There is logic behind that. I'm not just making that up. You can find that on my sub stack and I've done videos about it and stuff like that. But yeah, I 100% agree with you that I, it's not my preference to have violence, but I, I do almost wonder if we're on a track at this point where it can be um, avoided because... I think it's one of those cases that, um, you know, think about a game of chess. Like right now, the left is getting all their pieces into position and they're surrounding the king in certain ways. And right now, the left is about like maybe 30 moves away from checkmate, but they can see the finish line. And in, um, you know, in several years from now, they're going to be three moves away from checkmate. And that's when they're going to go. And that's when we're going to start to see the real violence. We may have violent skirmishes between now and then, but once they think that they're close to checkmate and they, all they need to do is pull the trigger and like they've got all these people people in the military they've got all these people in government institutions then that are just going to be like basically activated kind of like sleeper cells that's when the the real civil war is going to happen and honestly i actually think that when they start like when the left really starts their violent overthrow of the government i think it's going to go pretty quick to be honest, because I don't think the right is actually going to be prepared and I don't think the right is actually going to fight back in any real way because like all they do is like say 1776 and then they just go back to, you know, Twitter or like video games or sports or like whatever they were doing before that. Um, so I think that it would actually be probably a pretty quick process to overthrow the government. And none of that makes me happy to say. Um, I just think that that's the reality of the situation that they're that we're dealing in right now. And that's why I spend all my time trying to teach people here is what the left is. Here's what they're doing. Here's how they're organizing. Here's what you need to know. Here's how you need to recognize them. Because I think that educating people about what is going on and making and and doing it in a way. And just to be clear, guys, I, I want 
Like, I really want people to take the information I'm giving you on my Substack, in the videos, in these Twitter spaces and podcasts and things like that. I want you guys to take this information and I want you to use it to go out and teach other people what's going on. That is the purpose of this. This is not to make me some sort of internet celebrity or to build a brand or anything like that. I am teaching you everything I know in as clear a way as I can possibly teach it so that you have the resources and the information to go out and explain it to other people. You can find resources and graphics and things over on my Substack to help you out. Um, I'm, I'm always available for questions on my streams, on the Twitter spaces, that sort of thing. But I really do think that we all, that like those of us who are actually concerned about this and see this as a real problem, we need to start working together to teach as many people what's going on as possible to make sure people understand. Because I really do believe we are going to have this violent overthrow of the government in our lifetime. I don't think this is a joke. I don't think it's a game. I don't think this is for internet content. I think this is real. And um, so that's why I do what I do. And I really appreciate everyone coming into the Twitter space today. I do have to head because I do have a stream coming up at 5 p.m. Eastern time that I want to take a little bit of a break in between. I'm going to be actually talking to one of my favorite people. His name is Keith Knight today. He's writing a new book about World War II, and he doesn't think that Winston Churchill was a really good guy. And so that's kind of been a topic that we've seen lately with Tucker Carlson interviewing Daryl Cooper. It's a little bit off of the leftist topic that we're talking about right now. But Keith Knight is honestly one of the smartest people on this platform, and he's going to be coming on my channel at 5 p.m. I stream that on YouTube. I stream on Rumble. I stream on X. I stream on Kick. You can just look for Carlin Borisenko. No one else really has my name, so you can find all that. I'll be posting links to on the uh, timeline, so if people want to come and join us for that. And I would also remind everyone, please make sure you're signed up for my Substack. The, the email updates are free. Carlin, K-A-R-L-Y-N dot Substack dot com. The link is in my bio. And the very best resource, if you're new to me and you're new to leftist content, go to my Substack and go to the section that says how to speak socialist that's going to be in the top menu. And the very first link you're going to see on that is called a four hour on demand class, how to speak socialist. And I know it's four hours and I know that's a lot of time, but a lot of you have been sitting in here with me for almost three hours at this point. So you don't really have any excuse. I know you can do this. And um, what I want you to do is go take this class. It is completely free. There are two, two hour videos where I lay out all of these things um, that we've had, the, all of these clips that we've taken from leftist trainings over the past couple of years. So you can see explicitly what the left is saying about all of these things. I break it down for you. I explain it. This is something that you can take and show your friends. And I promise you, if you take this class, you will be able to see the left in a whole new way. It will blow your mind. It's, it's, I've, I've heard this over and over again that people are not aware this stuff is happening. Even people who think they're tuned into what's going on with like Fox News and all the conservative pundits and all that stuff. You haven't seen any of this. I promise you, this is stuff that's not being reported on. Um, and so that's a resource for you as well. And I want to thank everyone that came out. I want to thank everyone that participated. Please make sure you follow all of our wonderful speakers that came out today. I think I will be doing another Twitter space tomorrow, probably around the same time of 1 p.m. Eastern time. So if you want to come and join me for that, I would welcome everyone uh, to come and join again. And uh, that's all we have for right now, guys. I'm going to mute myself and just give a little bit of a pause so that the, the Twitter space recording doesn't cut off. But I appreciate you all. Take care. Have a great day. And we'll see you soon.